actually but, not the only thing. As mayor of the city of Stanton, I called the May 27th, 2021 regular meeting for the Stanton City Council to order. Uh, the first item, I would just like to let everyone know that um, if you've been vaccinated, you can take your mask off if that's your choice. Uh, if you have not, we're not going to ask you if you've been vaccinated or not. But um, if you uh, have not, we'll, we will ask you to please wear your mask. Now, whether you've been vaccinated or not, if you choose to wear it, that's totally up to you. And uh, it's my understanding that starting tomorrow, Mr. Rosenberg, uh, the um, audience will be able to sit wherever, wherever they, they would like. That the uh, please do not sit in this chair signs will be removed according to the uh, the governor's orders? Yes. Consistent with the action uh, to be effective tomorrow, we will remove all of the restrictions on seating in council chambers so that for your next meeting, the entire chambers will be open for public seating. Okay, all right. And the next meeting, as mentioned, um, you'll be able to sit wherever you would like. Um, I would just like to remind everyone we do have um, hand sanitizer at the entrance of the chambers. We have sanitizing wipes uh, at the podium. And we um, are happy to have everyone here this evening. I would also like to mention to the city council members that if you would like to speak, please recognize the mayor and the mayor will recognize you so you can um, address any concerns, questions, or comments. All right, with that is the Pledge of Allegiance. If you would like, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, stands one nation under God, 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 indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, the next item is the invocation moment of silence. And tonight it is my turn to do an invocation. Um, I'm going to give my disclaimer. According to the United States Supreme Court, I am allowed to do a Christian prayer. I invite you to join me if you so choose. If you do not want to, that's fine as well. So if you would like, please bow your heads. This is a prayer for God to reveal his will. Father in heaven, we commit this meeting to you. Come and reveal your will in every aspect of our life and ministry. As we discuss the affairs of the city of Stanton, we ask for your will to be done. Show us your purpose. Enlighten us that we may know how you want us to accomplish our task. We desire your glory and blessings in all we do. Direct our thoughts, words, decisions, and actions towards the right path and help us stay on track. Let your will be done as we plan and make decisions. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. All right. Next is the mayor's report. And the first thing I would like to read is a proclamation. The City of Stanton, Virginia proclamation. Miss Virginia Senior America 2020. Whereas, Lilchi Huffman is a 12th generation Virginian and a proud descendant of early leaders of the United States. And, whereas, Miss Huffman is an honored citizen of Stanton who finds nothing more beautiful and special than the Blue Ridge Mountains, the Shenandoah Valley, and her beloved Virginia. And whereas, as an educator and volunteer, Ms. Huffman has provided tremendous service to her community as a mentor and a role model to area pageant participants. And whereas, selected once again by Senior America as Miss Virginia Senior America, Ms. Huffman graciously exemplifies the dignity, maturity, and inner beauty of all Senior Americas. And whereas, Ms. Huffman represents the Commonwealth of Virginia in the city of Stanton with great passion. Now therefore be it proclaimed by Stanton City Council that the city of Stanton, Virginia honors Lilchi Huffman on the occasion of her selection as Miss Virginia Senior America and wishes her great success during her tenure. Dated this 27th day of May, 2021, Andrea W. Oaks, Mayor. Mayor Oaks, 
distinguished members of the city council, guest. Thank you very much for this. This is very touching. Um, it has indeed been my honor for the past two years to represent Senior America and Senior Americans in the Commonwealth of Virginia, my beloved home for all but 11 years of my life. And I'm proud to stand here and say that I am now 74 and a half years old. All of my education, except for four years, has been in the Virginia public schools and colleges and universities. So I am a dyed in the wool, deeply, deeply rooted Virginian. And I have loved representing my state, not only here within the state, but on the national stage, as well as in several other states. The Senior America program honors women who have reached the age of elegance, who are 60 or better. We are recognized and honored for the fact that we are now still viable members of our community, deeply involved in our communities and of all professions, from doctors and lawyers to housewives, to professional educators as myself, to just a wide variety of work that the Senior America women do throughout the United States. And so anyone interested, the Senior America website is available with all kinds of information about this program. It is the oldest of the pageants. It's 40 years old, 41, 42 years old this year um, to recognize senior women. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for this honor and for this proclamation. And I have certainly enjoyed representing Stanton and very proudly in all my travels say that I am from Stanton, Virginia. Thank you. All right, uh, the next item under the mayor's report. You may recall at the May 13th city council meeting, I acknowledged participants of the Leaders Advancing Democracy Mongolia, a program through the University of Virginia Center for Politics. As planned, because of the time zone difference, they took a time to watch the recorded council meeting after the fact during their class session this past Tuesday, the 25th. It was my pleasure to join them for a question and answer session where we talked about the responsibilities of city council, the importance of citizen engagement and some current events here in Stanton. I just wanted to take a quick moment to say thank you again to each of the program participants and to the University of Virginia Center for Politics. All right, next on under the mayor's report. I uh, wanted to give everyone an update concerning the talks with Middle River Regional Jail. Um, the mayors and chairs within the five localities, Rockingham County, Augusta County, the city of Waynesboro, the city of Stanton, and the city of Harrisonburg have gotten together a few times to just uh, consider a direction that we feel that the region should um, move towards when it comes to Middle River Regional Jail. And this uh, involves the um, beds and the expansion issue, along with, uh, that's the first part of it. The second part of it would be um, reviewing the criminal justice system and having a representative to speak on our behalf at the state level. So no new bids. I have a breakdown of the options um, concerning the original price estimates that have been presented to the uh, city council. I sent this on uh, Thursday, May 20th, but um, again, no new bids. That's been the recommendation of the um, mayors and chairs unofficial committee. Um, we do recommend renovations such as a water heater upgrades for the entire facility, lighting updates for the entire facility, 
public lobby update, improved security intake, um, property storage, visitation upgrades for legal professional. Um, that's when the attorneys come to meet their clients. Uh, mental health office upgrade, um, food service upgrade that involves storage and production space, and the uh, magistrate on site office. All of this would um, be renovated according to the breakdown that um, is being recommended. And the mental health facility is listed uh, as far as part of the renovations. Support services, inmate medical unit, add food service space to better serve population, inmate laundry improvements, additional administration, um, maintenance warehouse, expansion of current maintenance building and add um, a much needed warehouse space. So the um, recommended renovations, just your general renovations that I went over, such as your water heater upgrade, uh, $4,405,528. $4, your support service, $9,031,007. Maintenance warehouse, $1,131,948. A total of $14 million five hundred sixty eight dollars four hundred and eighty three I'm going to say that again four million five hundred sixty eight thousand four hundred eighty three dollars there we go um, this is um, quite a reduction from the forty million dollars that was suggested originally it was fifty million uh, it went down to forty million and then thirty million eighteen million was tossed around but we are now at the um, approximately 14.6 million for the renovations. And then we're also looking into having um, a representative to work with the state when it comes to um, criminal justice reform. So we are definitely moving in the right direction, it is my belief. Um, the mayors and chairs would like to be able to bring all five localities together, all of the elected officials on the city councils, as well as the uh, board of supervisors, bring us all together and just go ahead and um, with the direction that we have put out there to see if everyone's in agreement and to and welcome any other suggestions and to move forward with a plan that will work for this region and will be. Um, affordable, and it'll also be the right thing to do. All right, let's see. You guys can hang in there with me. I have quite a few things. Um, this year, the Happy Birthday America, the July 4th festivities will be virtual. I had the honor of being interviewed, so when you're watching the video, um, you'll see me on there. It was um, very much an honor to be a part of this video, the virtual video that will show on July 4th. Um, the Saul Local Response Fund, we met this morning, we discussed uh, community priorities, which are summer school support, tutoring networking, and we continue to focus on mental health, food insecurities, housing and homelessness, elderly care, technology and internet access, unemployment and workforce development. So there's a lot of... Um, outside agencies out there for the past 14 months that have been working with um, the um, Community Foundation under the direction of Dan Lehman through the uh, Saul Local Response Fund. This organization for the past 14 months has shared information with one another and it's great to see the collaborative efforts between the um, different nonprofit organizations trying to make sure that our community is well taken care of during the pandemic and then long after the pandemic. Um, I'd also like to mention the passing of Senator John Warner at age 94. Um, he was not only our Senator, but he was married to um, Elizabeth, Taylor. Elizabeth Taylor. She was a little bit before my time. And there might be a few of you out there saying Elizabeth who, but um, I did wanna uh, just um, recognize the passing of Senator John Warner. I'd also like to recognize the fact that um, we will be celebrating Memorial Day. Um, 
wanted to say that I am very grateful for the men and women that gave the ultimate sacrifice so that we could be free here in the United States. I'd also like to recognize the veterans and our men and women that are continue to serve today to protect our country. Do we have any veterans in the audience? Hey, if, if you can stand. Thank you, thank you for your service. All right, that leads us to additional items by members of council. Are there any additional items by members of council? Mayor Oaks. Councilor Darby. Uh, I would just like to uh, say congratulations to all of the recent graduates from Stanton High School, as well as from those that graduated from other high schools in the area or colleges. Uh, we've, you know, that's a great accomplishment and just wanna recognize that. So well done. All right, thank you. All right, moving on to the, oh, I'm sorry, Vice yeah, Mayor Robertson. I'll say one thing. Um, want to say about uh, this past Saturday, uh, Augusta Health reached 75,000 vaccinations given, uh, and the number continues to grow. They're now doing younger children. Uh, so again, uh, you know, I am definitely in support. If, if you feel like you want to get the vaccine, please sign up. There are plenty of spaces and plenty of vaccine to go around. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say, and um, I can't, cannot express my, how, <laughs> disappointed I am today in a vote that was taken by our EDA. Um, I think it was the wrong decision. I truly think it was the wrong decision. It was a decision that went against something that we as a city council, and I think that we had the majority of the city council was in support of. Uh, not just four, three, I'm thinking we possibly had six to one votes for it. But the EDA went against that to um, award uh, a piece of property over on Stanton Crossing to the Stanton School Board after even they made a $400,000 bid for it to solve a 50-year problem that has been plaguing this community where we're at the point now that we have buses stored up at buildings and grounds. It's uh, taking up police uh, department pl uh, storage. Um, the, all of the uh, works, uh, the building works that they've got is on the basement floor of Shelburne. And it's so bad at times that when that gets going and the fumes get going, we have to take our children and get them out of the school so that they can not breathe all the fumes that come up. And it, it is a fantastic location for the school board, a uh, place to store their dry goods, to store the uh, goods. It, yes, it needs work, but it's a great location there at Stanton Crossing right near 81 and 64. Uh, big trucks don't have to come all through the city to deliver things. It comes right off the interstate right there. I think it's the wrong decision. I truly think it was the wrong decision and I am so disappointed. Uh, in this EDA. Um, I know that's probably not what they want to hear, but I think they messed up. And um, I'm sure I'll be talking to some of them in the future. But uh, anyway, uh, I just wanted them to hear that. I think they screwed up and they, they messed with our children. And that's what ticks me off the most. So that's all I've got right now. Okay. This is Next. Carolyn Dahl. Councillor Dahl. First of all, there's a couple things. Uh, one is a democratic adage, way to be nonpartisan. And the next one is, I'll, I'll call this, it must be mentioned. You know, there are important things that must be mentioned. For example, tax increases, flood issues, and yes, how law enforcement officers have to stop murdering black people. I am amazed that I was included. And I'll reread the quote for you. It must be mentioned that ex-mayor Carolyn Dull has never attended a council meeting in person since I joined 
last July. Councilwoman Dole did have the ability to go to City Hall for a recent reception for Senator Kane on May 5th, but not to interviews for Council Clerk May 6th or our City Council meeting on 513. Yes, I was included on Mr. Claffey's official City Council Facebook page. Yet what he mentioned contained both sins of omission and sins of commission. So I am compelled to report the facts. First of all, I did not attend a reception for Senator Kane. I did attend a briefing where he discussed the ARPA federal funds and details on acceptable uses lasting about an hour. No option for attending virtually was offered to me and this was important information. So I attended with someone driving me there and assisting me up and down steps and curbs. Yes, I was doing my job. In fact, four council members had threatened that if I attended Senator Kane's briefing, they would have to ask questions about my condition. If I did not attend, they would just vote to allow me to attend virtually. Sounds like extortion, doesn't it? I had two surgeries and the surgeon wrote that I needed to attend virtually. Mr. Claffey expressed that he didn't know I had surgery, even though he had received two emails from me specifically stating that I had surgery. So I was subjected to an inquisition by the four medical experts and the vote was unanimous for me to attend virtually. I wonder why Mr. Claffey chose to attempt to bully me instead of publicly expressing good wishes or prayers for healing. The reality is that throughout the pandemic, I have followed the recommendation of the former federal administration, the current federal administration, the governor of Virginia, and the heads of the Virginia state and regional health departments who all said, if you don't have to go somewhere, stay home. Don't put yourself or others at risk. I modeled this behavior explicitly and did not put any city staff or the general public at risk. No one got COVID-19 because of my actions and I am proud of that. What is his obsession with seeing me in person? I guess one good thing is while he is attempting to bully me, he can't be picking on someone else. All right, are there any additional comments from council members? All right, hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the special called meeting of May 12th, 2021. Councilor Holmes. I move to approve the uh, the minutes of the special uh, uh, meeting on May 12th and the uh, uh, the regular agenda on um, May 13th. Okay, we're gonna awesome. do them separately. Oh, well, okay. okay. Well, then I, I move that we uh, uh, um, approve the special uh, meeting on May 12th. I second that. So we have a motion on the floor to approve the minutes of the special called meeting of May 12th, 2021. We have a second by Vice Mayor Robertson. Is there any further discussion? Mayor Oaks. Council Member Mead. I will be abstaining from the vote since I did not attend the meeting. Okay. All right. Are there any additional comments? Hearing none, Ms. Smith, please call the roll. Mayor Oaks. Aye. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Ms. Darby. Aye. Ms. Stoll. Aye. Motion carries. All right, now I'll entertain a motion for the approval of minutes for the work session and regular meeting of May 13th, 2021. Council Member Holmes. <laughs> I move to approve the uh, uh, regular meeting of May 13th agenda. Uh, the minutes. Minutes. I mean, minutes. Yeah. And, okay. and the work session as well. And the work right. session as well. So we have a motion on the floor to approve the work session and regular meeting minutes of May 13th, 2021. Is there a second? I'll second. We have a second by Vice Mayor Robertson. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Smith, please call the roll. Ms. Darby. Aye. Mayor Oaks. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Ms. Mead. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Ms. Dull. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. That takes us to the regular meeting. 
Item A, a consideration of appointment and employment of city clerk. Mr. Rosenberg. Mayor Oaks, Leslie Beauregard, our assistant city manager will present this item. All right, okay. thank you, Ms. Beauregard. Thank you. Um, so yes, and this evening you will appoint, um, formally appoint your city clerk. <laughs> Uh, she will begin her, uh, she'll be, her first day will be June 1st, 2021. Um, this is after we had um, two rounds of interviews. The first was uh, Zoom and the second was done in person. Uh, all very good candidates. And I think we did um, hire a very good individual. So we're, I'm excited to start working with her um, uh, next week, starting next week, so. Are there any questions for Ms. Beauregard? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion. Mayor Oaks. Councilor Darby. I move that council appoint and employ Rachel Zenny mm -hmm. as city clerk effective June 1st, 2021. All right, we have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Oaks. Council member Holmes. I second that motion. We have a second. Any further discussion? Mayor Oaks. Council member, um, Mead. Since I did not attend either of those sessions, I will abstain both. All right, thank you. All right, Ms. Smith, please call the roll. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Ms. Dole. Aye. Ms. Darby. Aye. Mayor Oaks. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. You sound really happy. Maybe a little. <laughs> <laughs> Morgan Smith has been our interim uh, clerk of council for some time now, and she has done just a phenomenal job. She and is. frankly, I would like to recognize her. Hey. All right, the next item on the agenda is a consideration of ordinance to amend the FY 2021 budget ordinance for the city of Stanton by adding budget amendment number five. Mr. Rosenberg. Madam Mayor, Phil Traer, the city's chief finance officer will present this item. All right, the Phil Traer show well, reappears. Well, it's just one item tonight. So. Yes, well, welcome Mayor, back. Thank you. Madam Mayor, members of council, it's a pleasure to be here this evening. Tonight, we are here to consider budget amendment number five for FY 2021. Budget amendment number five totals $5,129,104 and does require a public hearing, which was properly advertised and conducted on May 13, 2021. The breakout of budget amendment number five includes the city portion, $838,877, the school portion, $4,290,227. Details have been summarized in your package and were reviewed during the, F the May 13th, 2021 work session. Budget amendment number five includes a $195,000 provision in the general fund. 123,607 of that is for state carryover funds for street maintenance. We have 32,000 for police recruitment and retainage award from the state. We have 20,000 from the US Marshal Service and 19,000 for grant awards, insurance recoveries and donations. We have 119,302 for the CIP fund appropriation to appropriate additional revenue received from the state of, of Virginia for street paving. We have 101,000 for Blue Ridge Court Services for a pretrial expansion grant, a $1,300 credit in the grant fund, $16,000 in the water fund for insurance recoveries and a VERSA grant, $3.7 million in the education fund, 2.8 of that is the ESSER two funds, 700,000 for a CIP transfer and 360,000 for tennis courts at Montgomery Hall Park. 405,000 for school CIP, 27,000 for school cafeteria fund and 124,000 for this school state operated program. City manager recommends approval of this budget amendment as presented. All right, are there any questions for Mr. Treyer? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion. Madam Mayor. Councilor Clavy. I move to adopt an ordinance amending the fiscal year 2021 budget by adding budget amendment number five, totaling 5,129,104 as presented. All right, so we have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Mayor Oaks. Councilor Darby. I second. We have a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Smith, please call the roll. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Ms. Dole. Aye. Ms. Darby. 
Aye. Mayor Oaks. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Ms. Mead. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. All right, the next item is on item C, a consideration of cancellation of July 8th, 2021 City Council meeting. Mr. Rosenberg. Madam Mayor, as I shared with council during the work session, it's been the practice of council for years to consider the cancellation of one or more meetings during the summer season. Uh, this year, I reached out to members of council a few weeks ago to determine the level of interest in canceling one or more meetings this summer. And uh, based on the responses I received, it seemed that there was a consensus that emerged to cancel the meeting presently scheduled for Thursday, July 8th. You have in your agenda materials a resolution, which if adopted by council uh, will result in the cancellation of that meeting. So we would have two meetings in June as scheduled, two meetings in August in, as scheduled, but in the month of July, there would be only one meeting on Thursday, July 22nd. All right, thank you. Are there any questions for Mr. Rosenberg? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion. Mayor Oaks. Council Member Mead. I move to adopt the proposed resolution canceling City Council's July 8th, 2021 meeting. All right, we have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Mayor Oaks. Vice Mayor Robertson. I'll second that. Right, we have a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Smith, please call the roll. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Ms. Dull. Aye. Ms. Darby. Aye. Mayor Oaks. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Ms. Mead. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. All right, the next item is item E. Excuse me. Item D, a discussion and consideration of appointment of assistant city manager as alternate representative to regional bodies. Mr. Rosenberg. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, th this is what I would call a housekeeping matter. Um, various representatives of, of the city serve on regional bodies. So um, for example, the subject of this agenda, subjects of this agenda briefing include the Stanton Augusta Waynesboro Metropolitan Planning Organization on which I and uh, Council Member Dole serve um, on the policy board of that body in particular. And then the Middle River Regional Jail Authority, um, I serve on that board along with Mr. Trayer and Sheriff Robertson. And on occasion, um, it, Certain, certain individuals are unable to attend these meetings as they're scheduled. And the organizational documents of these regional bodies typically permit the designation of an alternate to attend in place of one of the primary representatives. So for example, if I am unable to make a meeting, the alternate city representative would be able to attend in my place. And so what we have here um, is a motion for council's consideration in the agenda briefing, which would appoint Ms. Beauregard as an alternate representative to represent the city at meetings of the SAW Metropolitan Planning Organization or the board of the Middle River Regional Jail Authority. And in the absence of one of the primarily designated representatives, Ms. Beauregard could attend meetings of those bodies and vote fully as if she were a member of those bodies. Happy to answer any questions you have. Ms. Beauregard, I tried to skip that one for you. <laughs> Are there any uh, questions for Mr. Rosenberg? And hearing none, I'll entertain a motion. Madam Mayor Oaks. Council Member Darby. I move to appoint Assistant City Manager Leslie Beauregard to the Policy Board of the Stanton Augusta Waynesboro Metropolitan Planning Organization as a designated, <laughs> designated altern alternate consistent with the SAWMPO bylaws and to the Board of Directors of Middle River Regional Jail Authority as an alternative member consistent with the service agreement of the authority in state law. All right, we have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Can Council Member Holmes seconds. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Smith, please call the roll. Ms. Dole. Aye. 
Ms. Darby. Aye. Mayor Oaks. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Ms. Mead. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Congratulations, Ms. Beauregard. All right. <laughs> All right, the next item is item E, a presentation of citywide flood study and possible mitigation strategies. I know we've been anxiously awaiting this particular study. So, Mr. Rosenberg. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, there's been a lot of effort on this project, and John Glover, the city's building official, is here to introduce the item. And I will note, uh, for the benefit of council as well as members of the public, who may be here on this item or to participate in matters from the public, we're anticipating that we'll spend about the next half hour on this item before moving forward with other items on the meeting agenda. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Madam Mayor, members of council, as you recall in last August, the city suffered two devastating floods in our, in our city. Um, extending from Zipsy Hill Park through the downtown area and other areas included. The first of which resulted in over $3.1 million worth of damages to businesses and residential properties. Recognizing the, the, the toll that this took on our city um, at your work session of September the 10th, 2020, city staff briefed you framing the issues and suggesting some next steps. Following that work session, it was determined that the city would undertake a hydrologic and hydraulic, what's termed as an H&H &H study, to inform the city as it considers various flood mitigation measures. The firm of Wiley and Wilson was engaged to perform the H&H &H study of the city um, and to, they're gonna present the results of that study to you tonight to include some possible mitigation strategies. The study will be included on, or discussion of the study will be included on subsequent city council work sessions. Um, I think you'll see why when you see the briefing, these are pretty big solutions. Keep in mind, these are engineering, purely engineering solutions. There may be other strategies that we could employ to mitigate some of the, um, the, the potential threat from these floods. Um, with that, I will turn you over to Mr. Dan Sutton with Wiley and Wilson, who will run you through a presentation about their results and some of those possible um, strategies. Thank you. Dan? I'm oh. not Dan, but I'm going to Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to call you Dan. That's okay. <laughs> I'm going to help Dan out. Um, oh, wait, go ahead, Ms. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, okay. thanks for having there we me go. here. Uh, <laughs> great. Yeah. So, I wanted to just go over the agenda. So I'm, I'm Dan Sutton. I'm a senior stormwater engineer with Wiley Wilson. And uh, today we're going to go through a few things. We're going to talk about the goals of this study. We're going to talk a little bit about how we're going to manage some of the expectations, um, go over what we found in our existing additions, what we found to be some of the level of service that the tunnels have right now, and then talk briefly about some of these proposed uh, solutions. So let me make sure I've got that. Great. So the goals of this study, First and foremost, we wanted to really understand and model that existing tunnel. And we did a lot of uh, looking at record drawings. We did some survey out here where we could, looked at old uh, photos and, and uh, studies that were done um, as, as uh, staff were looking at the tunnels throughout the years and, and put that together to create this existing model. And, and with that, we're able to really define the magnitude of the flooding risk out here, which is pretty great. And with that, we also were able to look at where are some of those points that are really causing the flooding and, and what can we do, what types of projects could we do, constructible projects could we do to, to reduce some of that flooding risk. Just want to talk a little bit about some of the things that we are talking about stormwater management, there's a few ways that you can manage that. Uh, low impact uh, design, you may have heard of that. These are small distributed BMPs or best management practices that kind of get, uh, I've got a couple of examples up here, rain gardens, some rain barrels. These are important. These service, uh, serve a, an important part of, of any stormwater master plan. Um, they don't do much for flood control. And that's what we're talking about tonight. We're talking about big, infrastructure, big pipes that have the ability to move floodwaters as quickly away from structures as possible. And that, that's what we're talking about tonight. And, and really, that's what the study was, was looking at. 
before we kind of get into some of the results, I did want to talk a little bit about uh, hydrology and, and talk about some storm events. You're going to be hearing you're going to be hearing a lot about 10 year, 25, 50, 100 year storm events. So I want to do a little bit of, of explanation of what that is. So our 10 year storm event is this is what we design our roads, our, our pipes, our, our inlets to. And in Stanton, a 10 year storm event is 2.1 inches. What does that mean? Um, I'm going to try to use uh, Lake Thames here as an example. You probably are familiar. It's about two and a half acres, 10 foot deep. During a 10 year storm event in Stanton, you uh, are producing about seven Lake Thames worth of water that needs to come down here and pass through the wharf. Um, during a 25 year storm event, it's two and a half inches, that's creating nine Lake Thames worth of water that needs to move down through here. 50 year storm, 13 Lake Tams worth of water. And that 100 year storm, 17 Lake Tams worth of water. So kind of starting to see the, the, the amount of water that we're dealing with. And, and it is, you know, it's a, it's a significant amount of water that we're trying to control and move away from our structures. Um, talk a little bit about the 500 here. Uh, per NOAA, the 500 year storms, 4.1 inches. If we look at that August 8th storm event, that was average of 4.8. So we're talking about a 500 year plus storm event here. And, and uh, in some areas you have, you know, well over five inches. Um, and, and I think when we talk about managing expectations, it's important to, to understand it, all of the projects that we're talking about tonight, none of those would be able to handle this. They would be um, overwhelmed by this storm. And it is not feasible to design this amount of, of capacity in any of the storms. So I think it's important to kind of understand some of those, uh, some of those expectations of what we can do. Um, so the study was mainly around the tunnels and this is, uh, this is uh, Peyton Creek right here. Um, about three and a half square miles of drainage area. It enters the tunnels up at Pump Street and goes down Central. Uh, Lewis Creek, about 8.1 square miles. That enters near Church Street and um, continues down through the wharf. They combine, the confluence combines an underground tunnel under the parking lot in the wharf. And, um, and, and that's, the, that's the area of what we were really studying. It's about 3,000 linear feet total of, of tunnel. And of that, about 800 feet are under buildings. And that's what I'm showing right here. So significantly more challenging when you have historic buildings over the top of them to try to come up with solutions that are gonna be, um, you know, that, that, that have buildings over the top of them. So again, more complexity to this, to this challenge. Let's talk a little bit about some of the 100 year floodplain. This is the FEMA floodplain. We see that as water is entering from Peyton Creek, uh, once that tunnel is, is overwhelmed, it, is, it starts coming down Central Ave, uh, actually ends up uh, going down Augusta and Central and ends up down at the wharf. And that's really kind of due to that inlet or that tunnel up there not having enough capacity. So it fills up and then overflows. A little bit different for Lewis Creek down at the wharf where you actually, again, don't have enough capacity there and, and actually creates all that water coming down there. It kind of creates a bit of a, of a bathtub, a pond down in the wharf where water, uh, if it can't get through that tunnel, needs to pond up basically above Augusta Street and then start going down uh, Johnson there. So, um, you know, a very challenging, uh, a lot of water trying to get through a, a small tunnel in that area. Let's talk a little bit about what we found. So we did a lot of modeling and uh, worked uh, many months with the city staff to, to work through the existing model and wanted to give you just kind of an idea of what you currently can pass through the tunnel. So starting up at, at Peyton Creek, uh, it's about a 10 year capacity or level of service. I'm gonna kind of use those uh, interchangeably here. Um, and as we move down there between uh, Beverly and Johnson, it's a bit of a grade break. So we've got a little bit more capacity in the tunnel there. And as it flattens out down in the wharf, you've got about that 10 year capacity again. Uh, Lewis Creek isn't quite as good. Um, that first section, we're seeing that uh, it doesn't uh, even pass the 10-year storm event. 
um, and is starting to come up now. That doesn't necessarily mean that a, a, a ten-year storm event is is flooding basements. It, it, it probably is more a, a case where it's coming up in the parking lot, and you're seeing some, you know, six six inches or so of water in the parking lot there. I, I didn't say this before, but when I say ten-year, just to kind of reiterate this, it. It's not that it happens every 10 years. It is that it is a probability that any storm is going to produce that amount of rainfall. So, um, but, but the, the Lewis Creek is a little bit less than 10 year capacity uh, at the confluence where they come together, same problem, a little bit less than 10 year capacity. We're seeing some issues there. And then as it goes under Augusta, um, a little bit more than 10 year, but again, a, a restriction right there when we're talking about trying to get a 10 year, 50, 100 years through there. Before I get into the, the actual projects, there are some things that could be done that would uh, increase the, the existing tunnel's capacity. And, and it starts with just you know, simply removing some of the debris that's in the tunnel. These are a few of the photos that we've been collecting and going through. And you can see some of the existing utilities that are in there that collect this debris and, and even you know, some of the, the rubble that has been collected on the bottom and cleaning those up is not going to get you a great deal of, of extra service, but it will maximize the amount of water that goes through there. And so I think this would be a good, a good thing to um, start doing is, is uh, going out and cleaning that, as well as cleaning what's in the tunnel right now, going out and being proactive about doing some cleaning of the creek banks upstream to make sure that that, that doesn't get down into it and block that up uh, would be another good thing to uh, to look at uh, implementing. There are some utilities that run through here and you saw how that is a, a point of not only is it a constriction in that tunnel but it's also a place where you could have some of that debris really collect there and, and restrict the amount of water that's going through there. So looking to relocate some of these utilities that we are that we know are running through there right now would be another uh, kind of a small first step to work through. Let's talk about the project. So this is Lewis Creek. And when we talk about Lewis Creek, the, the, Lewis Creek and Peyton, they're, they're kind of two different flooding areas. Lewis Creek is the wharf all the way up to the garage. There's a, quite a bit of a grade break there that then um, Peyton Creek is really uh, down Central Ave and that's where you're seeing the flooding. And so I'm gonna separate those two into those in, into uh, Lewis Creek projects and Peyton Creek projects. And this is uh, to, to try to manage and, and reduce some of the flooding risk at the wharf and up to the parking garage. So one of the first areas that we looked at was that confluence. We knew that that was a, a, a for sure choke point. And right now that is approximately, let me get to my page, I apologize, I haven't been going through here. That is approximately 18, 23 foot wide, I apologize, about 23 foot wide. And what we're proposing to do is to take that, actually widen that out to close to 40 foot. So almost twice as wide of a channel there. We don't have much capacity to go up because we've got uh, the parking right there. And so it really needs to get wider. So this uh, gives you about a, a 10 year level of service. So a little bit of, a, of improvement. Second project that we looked at is just downstream of the confluence. It's at the building. Uh, this is 120 Augusta. You can see some of the structure uh, underneath that building. And another area where we would uh, remove that building and widen that out, go from about 26 foot wide to over 40 foot wide to uh, increase the capacity in that channel. So uh, actually going into the parking lot there to really widen out that channel to, to get more capacity. Just downstream of that is the crossing under uh, Augusta Street. Photo's a little bit dark here, but you can see we've got the channel under the uh, 120 Augusta is about that big and actually goes down into this arch channel, which is quite a bit smaller there. And, and as we were modeling this and looking at the many different scenarios, this was really one of those choke points where we uh, definitely wanted to get a bigger uh, channel in there. And so uh, it's about 18 foot wide and we're going to uh, over 24 foot wide and making it a box. So right now it's that arch. So we're going wider and taller, getting a significant amount more um, uh, capacity in that channel. Right, yeah, that, that arch is not the most optimal uh, area. 
we also looked down, this is kind of the end of, of our project and, and we looked at uh, removing one, uh, this is 113 South Augusta Street and widening the channel in this area as well. Um, and uh, again, about a 10 year level of service for each one of those projects if you did them individually. And, and that's where we started to put all these scenarios together where we're trying to figure out what is the best mix. And, and this is a tricky area because if you do just one, you still have that restriction downslope of it. And if you do two, you still have the restriction. So well, the best case scenario for moving water through the wharf was actually to do the widening of the confluence, removing the building at 113 and replacing the, the arch culvert underneath Augusta Street. And you can see we're getting close to a 50 year level of service can pass through that now by widening out those, those areas and opening up some of those restrictions. We also looked at some other projects and we, we really were uh, you know, told to look at everything. Let's see what else is, is an option. So we looked at, at putting in a, a large eight foot diameter um, tunnel. This would take water from Lewis Creek bypass the wharf altogether. And um, uh, yeah, it would be a, a significant amount of tunneling and, uh, uh, and, and, and a very large pipe. Um, obviously very expensive and, and, and due to uh, several reasons, doesn't really give you a whole lot of, of level of service. But we did look at it at this case as, a, as another option for um, uh, bypassing the wharf altogether. Mentioned that right now, the. Uh, the wharf really acts as like a pond and we have limited ability to get water through there. Uh, when you can't let water get out into the floodplain, use mechanical means. So we looked at putting, installing a, a very large stormwater pump station. When I say very large, I mean huge. The construction that we are showing in that photo is, is kind of uh, what we would be looking at. Four foot diameter, two four foot diameter force mains, very large pumps to move a lot of storm water through there. Um, obviously a very expensive project um, and uh, uh, it does give you some, some decent uh, level of service though. Um, those were the projects that we looked at for, for Lewis Creek. I want to come up to Peyton now and look at some of the projects we, we, we looked at. The first section, this was that piece that had a 10-year level of service existing. It is uh, mainly an arched tunnel. And to increase the capacity of that, we looked at basically just coming up, making it a little wider and much taller and making that a box culvert through there or a box tunnel through there. That would require uh, open cutting of that entire section. None of that section right there is under buildings. It's all in the street. Um, so we wouldn't necessarily be affecting any of the buildings. Obviously, traffic would be greatly in, uh, affected by this construction. Um, but, but, but we're talking about uh, you know, getting close to a 100-year level of service by making that a little bit wider and much taller through there. We had the option on, on the Peyton Creek to go upstream and install some, some big, uh, or we looked at uh, installing some big flood control ponds. Um, you need uh, land, uh, hopefully that the city owns, in this case, Gypsy Hill Park. Um, and then you also need a very big drainage area coming down to it. And, and this really has both of those. And so the top pond would be located in the uh, adjacent to Peyton Creek as it runs by the baseball fields. There. And it would just be a big open dry pond graded down, giving a lot of capacity there. The other location is underneath the parking lot of the stadium. And this would look more like the, the lower picture there where it's large pipes, eight foot diameter, uh, put underneath the parking and then the parking goes back over the top of it. Um, and this, this you know, would, would allow for uh, detaining that water prior to it getting down to the tunnel. And so you would do this and not do any improvements um, to the tunnel itself and keep that as it is. We also looked up here at, at a tunneling project as well. Um, this has got a lot more uh, drop to it. So we were able to put a lot more water into that tunnel. This is a seven foot diameter pipe coming from uh, near the, uh, near that uh, existing uh, uh, point of, of uh, where the tunnel starts up there at Pump Street. Um, and uh, again, similar, similar to what we were talking about down at Lewis, a, a large tunnel, um, cored through a lot of rock and, um, 
You know, this would uh, have obvious, obvious benefits to uh, the, the flooding on Central Ave and some, uh, some positive effects on, on the flooding down at, uh, at Lewis Creek as well as you are bypassing quite a bit of that flow that's coming down there. Just want to wrap it up with talking a little bit of kind of some of the the cost to provide some of these levels of service and and I think John mentioned that you know this is the engineered big pipe solution and I think you know one of the real valuable pieces of our study is to kind of put a number to what it what these solutions would be. So you can compare them to other uh, non-engineering solutions and, and be able to, to see what, what is the best for the city. Um, like I mentioned, uh, maybe I didn't, but these are uh, all constructible. We feel that they can be constructible. If, they are, if any of these projects are deemed feasible, there's gonna be more study that needs to happen. And, and part of that study is not just how do we, how do we fit this in, uh, it's also looking at, we don't want to send more water down Peyton Creek just to cause more flooding down at the wharf. Yeah. And that's what would happen. You open that up. And so we want to make sure that we're not just pushing it downstream. Same with Lewis Creek as you open up Augusta and let more water down. We don't want to create flooding downstream and property damage downstream. And, and that's really part of that next step if any of these are deemed feasible to really get into that aspect of, of uh, making sure that we're not doing that. Um, that's all I had. John, anything to add? I appreciate your time. I don't think so. Thank you, Dan. Um, if, if you had any questions, we could try and answer a lot, Dan, here, but we, while well, he's here, but we do obviously, it's going to take a lot of further discussion. So, I, you know, we're trying not to get too far down the weeds of individual projects because it would take a lot more study to determine if they were even, you know, if they wanted to proceed with any of those. But yes. Thanks, Mayor Robertson. Uh, Dan, so, so I'm assuming. I'm assuming what happened to us last year, that, that's a 500 year, that none of this would even, we could do everything of this and still wouldn't do it. That is correct. And that is, yes, you're correct. Yeah, I mean, this If we still did fun. all that, would it maybe lower the water a little bit, but? I mean, yeah, you could say that, but you would still have damage. I mean, that, okay. is, that is so much more water than what okay. we were talking about. Councilor Mead. So you referred to these as the big pipe solutions? Correct. Yeah. So on top of the big pipe solution, are there additional things that we would need to do or should do to mitigate some of this stormwater movement? Yeah. And, and that's, you know, and I, I wanted to kind of upfront talk about those low impact design, more distributed. Uh, those are going to solve more of your nuisance, more, more uh, frequent flooding issues. And, and, and that's why I think those are really important to have in any master plan. You know, what we were looking at here was that big hundred year. That's what we're trying to solve here is the hundred year, get it away as quickly as possible. The more nuisance uh, type of, of situation, we've done uh, studies on that and, and looked at, you know, more of those distributed out through the, the, the city. But yeah, again, this was really the big pipe, get the stormwater as quickly away from our structures as possible. Thanks. Councillor Holmes. Uh, and you were talking about, are you talking about widening, widening some of these uh, streets or are you talking about just digging it out? So it depends well, 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 on, it depends on where it is. On the, the Peyton Creek, that is um, a, that is an arch that would go to a box, taller box about the same width. Um, if we can get a little bit more width, that'd be great. But um, really, it's about the same width and just taller in a box rather than the we arch. Would, we wouldn't have to take down a building or anything like that. Right now, on the Peyton Creek, we are not calling out. That's all outside in the street. And um, it, it, I, I would not expect you to, to need to uh, take down any buildings on that. Would there be any possibility? I, uh, like, I'm in front of uh, uh, Lewis Creek and... The first flood, we got a little bit, but the second flood, we got it bad. And it was because, I, one, the ground was saturated and we got four more inches, maybe seven inches, depending on what you heard. But, uh, you know, my problem there is we got a spring underneath uh, our building. So it wasn't coming through the door. It was coming through the floor. Right. You know, and uh, so, I, I, you know, I, I, I don't know what you could do down there. Would you widen it 
right there where the government's right in front of the, the parking lot is uh, across from the uh, uh, um, garage. That down? Down by the hotel. Okay. okay. Yeah, and I think right there we're talking about. That area really floods all the way down. Right. <laughs> and Amy knows because she lost her car in there, but it floods all the way down to the junction and that becomes a big pond or lake. Yeah. Well, actually, fast moving river. Right. Really. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that would be the section where we would, yeah, basically take that arch out, lift it up, make it a box, a taller box, and get a lot more capacity through that um, by, by, by upgrading to a, a, a box culvert over the arch. Are there any additional? Um, no. Um, okay. um, so let's talk about cleaning out the tunnels. So you said there would be an initial um, debris removal within the tunnels, just cleaning them out uh, completely. And then um, after everything has been set in place, how often would you have to clean the tunnels out at that point? I, th I think a, 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 a maintenance, you know, or mm -hmm. a, a in, um, inspection. inspection, thank you, uh, an inspection, you know, whether that's six months or a year, I'm not entirely sure how much, but some sort of inspection that would go down there and just be able to see how much debris is coming in there. Right. I can't really speak. I, I know as we were looking in there, we saw a lot of that. I don't know the last time that's been cleaned out or if ever, or if this, you're letting yeah. the stormwater. But there was definitely, you know, we showed a couple of pictures, but there's definitely debris in there. Um, I think that would be, I, I don't want to speculate. I think that would be something that you'd want to do some more um, inspections and then based on those inspections, do a, a yeah, clean out program. And that, that may exceed the capabilities currently that Public Works has. I don't know for sure, but it isn't just, you know, it's more than sending a few guys down to, to I mean, it's, it's a pretty big project. Just, yeah. Just clean it out. Right. Project in itself. That, that was my question, John, is it, it has, the Lewis Creek starting to gone through. Has it ever been? How far it looked at it is? Lyle Hart is here with me. I don't know how often do you all look down in the tunnels? Uh, typically, we we don't have a routine maintenance program or inspection at this point. That's that's obviously about to change. <clears throat> excuse me, uh, one way or another. But mm -hmm. I think what we're talking about initially is project not just again as john mentioned not just getting a few guys in there clean out but there's um it, it would have to be have to be designed even even the removal part would have to be designed and you know figure out how to get in there remove remove the rubble with and in siltation um in a live stream with very limited very limited access that would be the initial and then you know, as dan alluded to you know maybe a you know, at least an annual inspection seem like after the typical rains or after a certain a certain size event or something yeah. to uh, have someone on call to go and I mean, to me that the, just seems like the first step is just let's try to clean out that tunnel through there i mean i mean i just see if there's clean that, that may help us some you know do we even have the equipment necessary to clean it out currently we did uh, the city does not. It's something that would have to be contracted out, and certainly with the with the manpower as well. But even it would take um, take special equipment because it's it's so again just the access is very limited and, and pretty the far reaches uh, to get some of that out would be difficult. <clears throat> I was just, just going to add, I've, I've seen all kinds of things come down that river. Or, <laughs> I saw mattresses, I saw oh, mercy. all kinds of stuff come down in front of our place, you know, so it's, it can get pretty, and usually after a really heavy storm is probably when a lot of the stuff gets clogged up there, because I know we've had a lot of problems with trees that are growing on the inside yeah. of the bank, you know, and, and so they, uh, they, they definitely restrict the water flow too, I believe. You know, but. right? It can be patio furniture in someone's backyard that ends up in the creek, or swing sets. You know, propane tanks. We've seen those come down. So, um, um, hot tubs. You know, I've seen all kinds of things that have really? ended up in there. So, <laughs> so yeah. So, I, I definitely think you know, there's going to be a lot more discussion. There's other maintenance is one of those strategies that we mm -hmm. need to look at. But 
there's going to be a significant cost even to make, even to cleaning those out to start with. And I don't know whether Dan mentioned it, but I think he did. But even if we go in and do this maintenance, we're only picking up a few years magnitude of storm level of service by doing that maintenance. So am I correct on that, Dan? I mean, yeah, I don't, it's, it's hard to estimate how much exactly, but we're not picking up to the level of a 50 year storm just by doing some maintenance, you know. There's no way probably to, I mean, you get you get a four, seven inch storm. I mean, there's just nowhere where the water can go. I mean, I don't think you can do anything. You'd have to tear the down town down and build build new places for it to go or something. I don't see how we can um, uh, uh, protect against something like that. Um, Vice Mayor Robertson. Is, Steve, is it a possibility? I mean, if the Biden administration, I'm just thinking out there, if, if they end up coming to some kind of agreement with, in, uh, you know, a, a trillion dollar infrastructure bill that, that there might be some monies available for small cities such as ours? And well, I think, for? I think we certainly will receive funding. The mm -hmm. challenge will be for what purposes mm -hmm. may it be used? And that all gets to the definition of infrastructure, mm -hmm. which you've heard so much about. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I think that the big take takeaways here, and Mr. Holmes has, has mentioned it, and it's the third time we've heard it, that if we have a recurrence of the event that we experienced on August 8th of last year, nothing we do nothing. Yeah. will really touch that. Um, you've heard Dan say that these are engineering solutions there are non-engineering solutions that might ameliorate or mitigate some of these events. And so what staff will do is digest this study because this is just being presented, mm -hmm. just being received by the city. So staff has worked with Dan on pulling the presentation together so that we were confident you were getting information in a way that was understandable for you all and for me. And, and, and John and Lyle and uh, Jeff Johnston. And, and Lyle, have you presented to council previously? No, I haven't. So just to make sure that you all are aware. I haven't seen his face. This no. is Lyle Hart <laughs> and he's the city engineer and has been the city engineer since Mickey, Nikki Mills uh, departed several months ago. Lyle was um, in public works as a utilities engineer previously, and he's now transitioned into the city engineer position. And we've also moved the city engineer function so that it resides in public works now, rather than in community development where it was previously. So John and Lyle and Jeff Johnston um, and uh, Pete Kessiker, who's our uh, stormwater guru will all digest what has been delivered to the city and we'll come back to you at a subsequent work session with um, I, I think a broader presentation that includes some staff recommendations based on what we've received here in the study and other measures that might be taken. And then, then the challenge becomes working those things into the CIP. Um, Mr. Rosenberg, let me ask you, how much were the damages concerning the um, the two floods? Well, I think we only have a good estimate on the first event. Okay. Um, it was around $3.1 million, and that was residential, commercial, and public um, structures that and, was and, and buildings. And the time. second event, which was two weeks later, yes. on the 22nd, was more localized. Mm -hmm. In its effect, um, it primarily affected the wharf. And I think if I'm recalling correctly, that's because the one event really was focused on, the first event was really focused on Peyton Creek. And the second event was focused Lewis. on Lewis Creek. Right. Um, so I don't think that the damage in the second event was anywhere near as extensive in terms of its uh, cost, but it was a real gut punch because, especially in the wharf, people had already started recovery and reconstruction. Exactly, mm -hmm. and er everything was damaged all over again. Yeah, yeah. Bistro had just painted their walls that day after putting them back up. <laughs> uh, Councillor Holmes, is there any way that any of this water could be diverted before, like upstream? Like, is there anything that you could do? 
there that would maybe lessen a little because you know a lot of the rain might happen further up river and then and then it's, it'll be emptying out this way and then we get heavy rain on top of it so it's like i just didn't know if there was any way we could divert the, the water coming into into the city or or have places like you know like they build these runoff pools or something when they're doing construction is there anything like that that you could do upstream that would help well, I think, you know, the, the more feet of tunnel you have to build, the more it costs. And we already saw from this presentation that two of the tunnels they mentioned were, I could get $40, 60000000 million to put these tunnels in, and they were not that long. So if you go out close to city limits and try and pipe around like you would, I mean, it's just the cost would be extravagant for the I benefit part of you the receive. the is everything's underground anyway. It's not open. So, you know, it kind of forces it into uh, a, a tighter stream. Plus, two of the projects also were were um, ponds, basins, that sort of thing, detention. Um, and again, they they helped some, but the level of service wasn't even up to a hundred year storm level of service. So, you know, the benefit versus the cost is 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 what you have to look at. I hope that answered your question. It did. Thank and you. I'll apologize for not introducing Lyle. I thought you all knew him, and I was very rude when I got up here. Just so welcome, Lyle. <laughs> Good evening. Thank you. Um, any additional questions, comments? Thank you so much. I know that this is a lot of information, but we'll be breaking it down. So thank you again. And we'll be sure to make the slide deck available to council and uh, find a way to make it available to the public as well. Okay. All right. Um, thank you for your hard work. Thank, thank you. you. It looks like we um, are going to have quite a few folks to speak tonight. So I am going to allow a five minute break for the city council members to be able to use the restroom. So we're gonna take a five minute break. Okay, we're back from break. The next item on the agenda is matters from the city manager, Mr. Rosenberg. Um, Madam Mayor and members of council, I just have one item that I'd like to share with you all and uh, with the public. Um, I think as we've noted previously, many of the restrictions imposed by the governor through his executive orders come to an end tomorrow. Um, and I've become aware that there's been some um, misinformation um, in, in the business community in particular, and I, I want to provide correct information. There has been some um, misunderstanding that with the end of the restrictions that our dine out in downtown participants would no longer be able to serve uh, alcoholic beverages on Beverly Street when it's it's closed over the weekend. And I want to assure council members as well as customers who patronize those restaurants that nothing will change. Um, we have uh, had communications at the highest levels of the of uh, with ABC um, earlier today and confirmed that some information that was being communicated to the restaurants was inaccurate. Um, and that was not being communicated by city staff. It was coming from other sources. Uh, but we, knowing how important Memorial Day weekend is and you know how much business is anticipated over the weekend, um, we went directly to ABC at the highest levels and received confirmation that in fact, nothing will change and that current arrangements will continue at least through the end of June and likely well beyond that. So I, in case council members or the public had heard some of this inaccurate information, I wanted to make sure that everyone was aware uh, that things will remain unchanged. And, and that's a positive because that the shop and dine out in downtown, as you know, has been a tremendous success, not only for our downtown businesses, but also for the city in terms of the tax revenues that it has produced. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, the next item is matters from the public. I'm going to read some rules before we get started. Matters from the public. This part of the city council's agenda is entitled matters from the public. It is a time that council sets aside to hear from citizens and others about a wide variety of subjects. 
Before we begin, I'd like to share five basic ground rules that we ask you to respect as you make your remarks. Number one, please come to the podium, identify yourself, and complete your remarks within five minutes. I will let you know when you've reached your five minutes. We ask that you please give your name, your address, and then keep your remarks at five minutes or less. When you reach the five minute time, I will let you know that your time has expired. If you continue to speak, I will ask you to step away from the podium. If you continue to speak after I inform you that you have exceeded your time limit, I will ask you again to please stop speaking and step away from the podium. If you still continue to speak, you may be charged with disorderly conduct under Virginia Code Section 18.2-415A2. Number two, this is a time for us as a council simply to listen to your remarks. In an effort to encourage and maintain orderly conduct, we will not engage in give and take debate. If you seek information, you may mention it during your remarks and the city manager or his staff may get in touch with you in the days ahead. <laughs> Number three, we ask that you direct your comments to council as a whole and not to identify members of council or to identify employees of the city. If you want to take up an issue with an individual member of council or an employee, please speak with us before or after the meeting. We are also accessible by phone, email, or mail. Again, we ask that you direct your comments to the council as a whole. Number four, we expect every speaker to be civil and courteous, using profanity, making personal attacks on an individual unrelated to the performance of their duties on behalf of the city of Stanton and doing anything that is disruptive to the orderly conduct of this meeting will not be tolerated. Number five, finally, as the presiding officer, it is my duty to remind you that if you choose not to abide by these ground rules, I may find that you are out of order and will ask you to withdraw <coughs> from the podium. We certainly do not want to reach that point and even beyond. So we respectfully ask for your full cooperation in observing these guidelines. If you wish, you may obtain a copy of the ground rules from our interim clerk of council, Ms. Smith. And now we welcome all speakers. The podium is now available for matters from the public after we hear a few words from our city attorney, John Blair. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, after the conclusion of the last city council's meeting matters from the public, there was some uh, question about a couple of the rules and I wanted to clarify them. Uh, first, there is a rule about personal attacks and to be clear, an individual who speaks tonight may mention individual counselors, but they may not mention things that do not relate to that counselor's official duties. Uh, stuff that relates to their personal life that has nothing to do with their official duties or something like that would be considered a personal attack. But again, anything that relates to their official duties, certainly the public is entitled and has a right to speak to. As to the rule about speaking to counsel as a whole and not a, a individual counselors or employees, that rule is designed because this is a time for the entire council to hear matters from the city. That does not mean that during your remarks, you can't reference individual counselors, but it has to relate to business that relates to the city council. It can't just be, I personally have something that I'd like to talk to uh, John Blair, Steve Rosenberg, Mayor Oaks, or Brenda Mead. If it's just solely related to one person and not city business, this isn't a forum for that. But if it's related to the official city business, then address your remarks to the council as a whole, and you can mention individual counselors. All right, thank you. And with that, I'd like to read a statement. Pursuant to federal law, we will now have one individual participate electronically at tonight's meeting. Mr. Rosenberg. Uh, Madam Mayor, we'll bring the, the one um, individual onto the Zoom platform to participate at this time. Is, is the individual not on the platform? One moment, one moment Madam Mayor. Madam Mayor, while we work through this, um, why don't you go ahead and proceed with participants in council chambers? All right. Welcome. Thank you. I'm 
Randy Laird, a resident of the city, and we own property on Byer Street in Middlebrook. I would like to, uh, Madam Mayor, council members, uh, I would like to register a complaint to city council and to the city manager on how the business property owners on Byer Street, five through 29, were treated today. The group filed an appeal ahead of the deadline to the Board of Equalization regarding the assessment of these properties. I was told at today's hearing that I did not have authorization to speak for others, at which point I asked for recess and returned with documentation from each property owner giving me that authorization. I was then told that the documentation of authorization needed to have been submitted at the time of the appeal. When I turned in the appeal form in person, I said to the individual in that office to please let me know if you need anything else and does everything look satisfactory? The response was yes. The city assessor's, the city assessor's office has made no attempt to give a group of taxpayers a contiguous block of property owners a voice in discussing their increased assessment. This is despite, as we've talked about, I've heard in this, this hall earlier, about a, a year long pandemic and not one but two floods that significantly impacted our well being at the wharf. Data shows that a major flood followed by a non major flood can reduce property values by up to, and sometimes in, in cases, more than 15%. Our assessment increase for the block was 5.9%. Now, the good news maybe is lower values are temporary, assuming the problem can be remediated, but it doesn't sound what I've heard tonight that it's gonna be remediated anytime soon. As a group, we are disappointed, frustrated, and angry that the city we invest in, live in, is not more helpful to its taxpayers and its citizens. It appears that the city's top level managers look for ways to thwart constructive dialogue rather than helping citizens through a difficult time. We request that city council and the city manager at a minimum counsel the city assessor and his staff on providing assistance to taxpayers in filing an appeal. No one going forward should have to endure the futility and disrespect we as a group have suffered as we did today. Thank you for your time and have a nice evening. Thank you, Mr. Lair. Thank you. Do we have the caller online yet? Uh, please okay. move forward in chambers. Next. Welcome. Hi. I'm Galen Sigmund and I live downtown on Jefferson Street and I would just like to speak um, about the changes in the memorandum in regards to limiting the freedom of speech in the community. I have sent um, multiple emails, only heard back from one who I know, I don't really expect to hear back from the people that I am sure are going to be voting against it, but I've not heard any emails back from anybody else. Um, I find it really disappointing. I am frankly sick and tired of this ongoing fight and being silenced. I would just like to ask that you guys do not move forward with this change. I feel like it's very disrespectful. And I also made a comment in my email suggesting that you should stand for the community if you're gonna be against us coming in, I mean, sorry, coming in in general or using telecommunication systems and that there's a lot of elderly people, a lot of older people, a lot of hard workers, laborers, restaurant workers that are having to stand through this. Luckily, I'm hopefully we'll have some more seats next week or next meeting, but I find it really disrespectful to the community that you guys are silencing us. And I think that there's a lot of people that will back me up on this. Um, there are signs all around where council member Darby and council member Claffey made comments in their campaigns. And I'm sure most of you guys made com comments in the campaigns and I don't have the exact quotes on me right now that you would 
want to hear the whole community speak and everyone should be able to speak. And by limiting it to 10 people, that's absolutely the opposite. There is no grounds to be silencing the people. I understand it's probably frustrating to have a, a lot of people needing to speak and you might feel bulldozed at times, but at the same time, if there's something that is such a contentious subject and the, and the community needs to speak to you guys, then it should be heard, especially when I'm not even receiving emails back. I, you, you made a It was made a comment that we can speak to you before or after or email, but we're not getting responses. We're not getting being acknowledged. So this is why we need to be able to show up here. And frankly, we should be able to do it over telecommunications like the rest of most of Virginia allows because there are disabled people that can't make it in. There's people that don't have rides. There are people that are at work right now and cannot leave work. It's there's people with children that would, would have loved to speak tonight, but they had to get their children home because they have children. There's a lot of situations where people can't make it in. And it's actually really tiresome to have to stand through the whole city council meeting. And I just would really like to see that you guys do not move forward with this. And I also believe that you might be surprised that you will have a lot less lashback and this has been a continuous fight and it's just a really big waste of time. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Welcome. Thanks. Hi, my name is Pete Stallings and I live on 2104 Poplar Street right next to the park. And I think this proposed amendment to the memorandum is the kind of thing that people write up when they're frustrated their agenda is not being it's not happening and it's being met with resistance. And it's the kind of thing that people write that when they're scared and it's been written by elected public servants who are afraid to serve the public. And, and I think everyone up here was elected to help steer our city to a better, brighter place. And you've repeatedly tried to stifle the voices of those that oppose you in the middle of a pandemic. You know, we can't, zoom call anymore and people are standing out there there's a whole line of people out there and they can't even come in and in a perfect world i think we as stanton citizens would have complete unfettered access to our council members and we could just call you or email you whenever we wanted to we'd have your cell phone numbers we could text you and tell you that it's a complete waste of your time trying to restrict our voices because we're not going anywhere and we're just going to keep coming back if you keep trying to do this so thank you all right, thank you. Next speaker. Hi, welcome. Hi, my name is Suzanne Fisher. I live in Waverly Green. Um, and I have two short um, things to say. First is I wanna thank Councillor Robertson for continuing to urge people to get the vaccine uh, the COVID vaccine, I find it very disturbing that so many people are preventing us from having complete immunity. And to them, I would say, do you know anyone who has polio? And no, you don't, because there was a vaccine developed when I was a child. And my parents lived in fear of their children getting polio. And that is not a fear anymore. And it's because of a vaccine. And uh, it's just so thank you for continuing, continuing to mention that. The other issue is about speaking in council chamber, um, speaking at meetings. Um, what puzzles me is what council members who want to limit um, people's ability to speak, what you have to gain by limiting this and other than um, displaying power. Why so much micromanaging? Only so many people can speak, only so many in person, so many on the phone, only so many minutes. You can say, can't say this, can't say that. Um, I feel like sometimes the citizens of Stanton are being treated like unruly middle schoolers. Frankly, I'm tired of hearing and talking about this issue, and I'm sure that council members are tired of it too. There are so many concerns that are important to our city. And so if we could just get rid of this one, we could pay more attention to the others. Why not go back to the way it was before? 
as many people who want to speak can speak for five minutes in person or on the phone. It's so simple and so inclusive. Yes, it makes for long meetings, but I've been here since five o'clock too. And you were elected to serve and listen to the citizens of the city. We come here or listen to the meetings to observe the actions of our council and to participate. Tonight in her report, Mayor Oaks used the phrase, the importance of citizen engagement. And we're here, here we are engaging. So please let us continue to engage with you at will. This is a free speech issue. And thank you for listening and reconsidering. Thank you. Next speaker. Welcome. Good evening. Um, I'm Matt Fitzgerald. Um, I live at 261 Thornrose. I'm here regarding the angst about uh, proposed changes to matters from the public. Uh, for what it's worth, I'm, I'm always in favor of more listening, transparency, and accessibility at all levels of government. To some, these changes could appear to work against that. <clears throat> but then I thought to myself, is this really about listening, transparency, and accessibility, or is there more to this issue? I dove into the publicly available numbers, and uh, since July of last year, there are 94 unique Stantonians that have spoken 191 times, spread across 20 meetings of this body uh, during the MFTP. 21 people, 21 people spoke two to three times, seven people spoke four to six times, and incredibly, there are four individuals that have spoken to you a whopping 10 to 13 times, okay? Nearly uh, at least every other meeting, if not more. About 45% of all MFTP comments since July have come from 11 individuals. Among these frequent commenters, the tone is often quite angry and derogatory, where the line between criticism and simply venting is not only blurred, it's, it's totally absent. Um, so could this be that this is happening to reduce transparency and accessibility to the public? Or perhaps more accurately, is it to curb abuse of the matters from the public commenting format, where a small group of militant, abusive, and, and angry people vent, usually on the same issues, often breaking the set rules for dialogue, whether it's personal threat, lobbying personal insults, and refusing to yield the mic after exceeding allotted time. The same abuse of comments are commenters who, instead of coming here to work towards a better standing, are here to score gotcha points for a Facebook post or stream or to provide the scoop, however real or contrived, on an expose of the news leader, who eagerly laps up any, any opportunity to, to deride certain local government officials. Is it constructive criticism or just wicked burns poised to exploit for future political, social, or civic benefit? Could it be that many of you attending here in the room and also online, uh, some for the first and second time at the urging of these abusive commenters, have come because of attacks to the First Amendment and Americans for Disabilities Act or the ADA? Have you been misled by the ones who actually abused this format? Had their abuse not occurred, will all of you continue to enjoy the opportunity for greater access to this body? Should the ones here with signs direct their ire at city council or to those who have abused this format? Who knows, maybe I'm wrong. These are just questions that I don't expect the answers for that specifically. Uh, but regarding listening, transparency, and accessibility, I do expect the cooler heads of city council to prevail on this. I do expect the most of you, including the one that I haven't voted for, to, to tr do truly understand the importance of the First Amendment and the ADA, regardless of who is speaking. I do expect that, the, that it will continue to be an emphasis for Stanton's legislative and judicial processes and not left to the hands of the mob rule. Mob rule in the end is no friend of the First Amendment or accessibility. If it were me, I'd approach this important issue by looking at data and methodology, not mob rule or politics or woke virtue signaling. So back to methodology and numbers for a minute. The Americans for Disabilities Act contains specific guidelines for providing accessibility for thousands of everyday life issues. Things like accessible bathrooms, exits, parking spaces, all very important and all are based on, are based on analytic data procured over many years. And what the ADA does not require though, is for every parking, space, every parking space or entrance to be accessible. Further, while the ADA does not have guidance for meetings, the ADA has no approved guidelines for offsite meeting participation. So let me repeat, there are no ADA guidelines for offsite meeting particip participation. So perhaps the data in ADA will be updated on this in coming years, but until that happens, and as it relates to MFTP, 
While providing accessible accessibility is important, it's just like the rest of the ADA, it should be done in proportion to the actual need. Nearly one third of Stantonians have utilized only the NFTP call-in system since July. That's 20% of the comments. The effect of COVID on that number is unknown. And if COVID weren't an issue, it's likely that many of those people would have come to City Hall anyway, but who knows? Perhaps post-COVID data will provide more clarity. The point, however, is that while providing accessibility for MFTP is an important need, that need should be paired with a reliable, cost-effective system that promotes constructive comments and criticism from the public. That might not be the same system previously in place. It may not be a robust. It may not be as robust either, but it should be proportionate to the actual need. So, to sum up, for all San Antonians here with signs, and especially news leader or TN TV this year, please seek out all sides of this issue. Listen for yourselves, and then determine honestly whether the First Amendment and ADA are actually being attacked, or if this is all just another partisan issue that fans the flames of emotion and anger. If it's the latter, then I think we all really need to ask ourselves, are we contributing to the betterment of Stanton, or are we contributing to more, just more division and strife among all Stantonians? Your time is up. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Welcome. Hello. Hello. Oh, I'm caller six. I don't get to talk. My name is Pam Dettelbach. I live at 145 North Coulter. And I moved here two years ago because I love Stanton. But I'm very concerned about council taking up time with issues that don't need to be addressed. There's plenty of other things that you all could be doing to help this wonderful city. I was a little concerned when earlier someone mentioned about the three minute time period, and that's what other towns have taken up. But according to the news leader and uh, one of your employees, they said most areas have three, four or five minutes. So it's not like everybody else has only three minutes. I think limiting to 10 people is a little bit dangerous because then it seems like, oh, well, let me pick my five and you pick your five or whatever. We all deserve a voice. And I think that you have a lot more better things to do than worry about changing this rule. Thank you very much for your time and don't put my phone out of business. Thank you. Next speaker. Hello, my name is Welcome. Raven Beveridge and I live uh, on Poplar Street here in Stanton. Um, so growing up, we're told to always stand up for what we believe in, for what we feel is right, to never back down from a challenge, to never give up, to treat others the way that we would like to be treated, to fight for those who have been beaten down and to help those who are less fortunate. We were taught these values as children and we teach our children these values today. I think in general, growing up proves to be pretty disappointing always. Um, and in my life, a good bit of that disappointment has come from realizing how many people have lost those values. And here I am tonight, very much disappointed again. Um, there's been many instances of this council treating a rather large group of citizens with disdain and disregard. Citizens that have over and over again proven that they actually hold those values near and dear to them. These citizens who have only ever fought to make this a better community for all of its residents. I've watched them be met with sighs and eye rolls and when they really should be met with applause. To come and stand here every single week to take hours away from their personal lives, to come informed and prepared, to continue to show up for others for what they feel is right, to really fulfill their civic duties as citizens of Stanton and to not back down. I find that very admirable. I strive to have those val to have values that strong and I hope to be surrounded by community members who also show up and speak up like they have been doing. This is a city that tries to take care of its citizens and a city that wants to strive, but a city that tries to shut those voices down, a city that is intolerant of any opposition, that's a silly the city with like a pretty cowardly leadership. And I'm not here for that. 
Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Welcome. Thank you. Let me get my, my little ditty that I wrote up. Um, good evening, Council. Uh, my name is Lauren Hurston, and I'm a recent homeowner of a property on West Beverly, something of which I'm very proud, not only because of the inherent achievement um, and privilege to do that, but also to solidify that I'm officially a Stanton resident. Um, I love this town, as I'm sure everyone here does, um, and that's why I'm speaking tonight. I'm referring to the amendment regarding the time limits for the matters of the public, public section of these council meetings. I'm struggling on how to interpret this, and perhaps the council can educate me. Could it be a backlash from the last meeting where several concerned citizens showed up to speak out against the proposed rezoning of the West End? <clears throat> Was there something said during that meeting that caused the council to not want to hear from its citizens? With all due respect, if this is true, it's truly a shame. We don't have to tell you that your role on the council is to serve the public. You know that. It's not the other way around. Asking Stanton citizens to even further limit the amount of time to make a speech on sensitive issues that may affect their homes, families, neighborhoods, or even their very livelihood is actively sending a message that the council does is not open, nor are they welcoming to hear from their constituents. Now, I've had the privilege and I was fortunate enough to attend college and study language and writing and how to have the skills to write a five minute or even a three minute speech. And even for me, this is difficult. <laughs> I wonder if you know how much more difficult it would be for somebody who didn't have the means to go to college to learn these skills or for someone whose first language is not English. Limiting our voices to be heard is at best disrespectful to us. At worst, it's classist and it's ableist. There's another, I'm not going to say that. <laughs> Hearing from the public who elected you, even if you don't agree with them, should not be a matter of yours and our civic duty, but it should be an honor. You need us and you need our feedback. I hope that you examine and regard the opinions from the citizens of Stanton with earnestness, thoughtfulness, and kindness. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Madam Mayor. Yes. We have the participant online who is available at this time, if you would like to take that. Okay, let's go ahead and take the uh, caller online and then we'll go back to the audience. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Please state okay. your name and address. Sure. This is Nitin Arduzzi, South Jefferson Street. I'm calling in tonight to express my concerns over the issue of accessibility. As a member of the disability community, I was allowed this remote participation accommodation only after filing an official request with the clerk of council. My request then had to be investigated by another city employee in order to verify that I did indeed have a valid medical reason for needing an accommodation. After I was able to provide enough personal medical information in order to qualify, I was sent a unique login to participate via Zoom this evening. While this process satisfies the bare minimum of what the city is legally required to do, it is by far not the most practical, nor is, is it the most equitable solution that Stanton could offer its community members. And let's be clear, I would not have been required to do any of this had our council been committed to doing their job equitably and in a just and timely manner in the first place. The issue of accessibility is not a new problem that our society is just now finding out about. Our disability community has been telling us for years how utilizing technology to improve civic engagement is about humanizing disabled people in the ways that we design our social structures and institutions. Making us jump through hoops, share personal information with strangers, and ignoring our demands to make access easier, not more cumbersome, is not an honorable path for the city to take. So I am courage to know that the city is indeed willing to offer remote participation to all citizens. It is the right thing to do. However, I must still address the mentality of the majority of council that created this unnecessary waste of time, energy, and resources because they had the power to simply say yes months ago. Whether through willful oppression or a simple inability to understand social justice issues, this council continues to demonstrate a lack of capacity for the duties they have been entrusted with.
Just today, I read a scholarly article that addressed tenants for social accessibility, which listed priorities such as designing for accessibility ought to incorporate users with and without disabilities, and design should address functional and social factors simultaneously. What that means is that you have a duty as my local leader to pursue equitable policies and practices, and to make Stanton's motto, you belong here, feel real to me. What this means is that by making our city more accessible to everyone, you create paths for people from the disability community to engage in society in ways that welcome us and that serve the best interest of all. But you continue to refuse to actually advocate for marginalized voices and instead seem to be focused on making it more difficult for us to engage, censoring what we can and cannot say, and taking time away from citizens to speak in order to give yourselves the last word. None of Vice Mayor Robertson's recommendations make sense for our citizens. They only serve to insulate counselors from accountability. So I say no limits on the number of speakers should be imposed, and the five minutes of allotted time for each speaker should remain. Vice Mayor Robertson forgot to mention that while the survey of other localities did include five public bodies that only offered three minutes to citizens to speak during public meetings, six other localities offered four, five, and unlimited amounts of times for citizens to speak out. So the question is, what kind of city council do you want to be? Do you want to be a council known for aiming to provide the least amount of privileges for our citizens? Or do you want to be leaders known for championing individual liberties? What kind of message are you sending the people that you took an oath to serve? How are you trying to emulate the most crucial aspects of democracy by oppressing your supporters' rights just to silence the dissenting voices like mine that you occasionally encounter? It seems that you are leaders who do not care about your own collateral damage, but instead care more about how uncomfortable it is for you to sit there in your seat of power and simply listen to the valid grievances of your neighbors. I sent a letter over a month ago to city council asking several questions that the majority of you have not responded to. During my last interaction with the mayor at the May 13th city council meeting, she told me that my questions had indeed been answered and that she would have the city lawyer follow up with me. But to date, no one has reached out and no one has answered these questions. So I will ask them again. Have you reached out to Stanton's disability community to ask us how you can serve our needs better? Have you researched best practices for inclusivity and accessibility for a myriad of the ways that the city can incorporate accessibility into mun municipal planning? Have you asked city staff if they have conducted an ADA self-evaluation within the last three years because a self-evaluation is a public entity's assessment of everything, including its programs, services, activities, facilities, policies, practices, and procedures, which will help the city to identify and correct barriers to access that are inconsistent with its Title II requirements. Have you heard any of the Your calls from up. our community to prioritize diversity up. and inclusion? In Your all time is up. Please drop the call. Have all right, our next speaker. Hello, my name is uh, Coy Hurd. I live in the house I own on Hampton Street. Um, I wanted to come up and, and speak uh, just briefly about the practical importance of hearing from constituents. Um, there are a limited number of people on city council, a limited number of city employees, all of you are human beings with uh, uh, fundamental limitations on time, energy, attention. Um, and it's not possible to know everything that's going on in the city and how it will affect everyone in every community, right? Um, that's just what it means to be human, right? Um, which is why hearing from constituents is so important, that uh, you can't be expected to know everything that's going on in the city or how every piece of business that comes in front of council uh, is going to affect uh, the different people, the different communities, the different locations in the city. It's a complicated job. Uh, and to limit the number of people who can speak to you and to limit the venues and the opportunities that people have to speak to you is tying your own hands, is, is hobbling yourself on the job that you have taken on to, to help make Stanton a good place to live, to help solve problems that we all have, right? And uh, one of the most poignant parts uh, demonstrated by the, the previous speaker is that the people who are easiest to overlook 
uh, people who uh, have disabilities, people with, with family obligations that keep them from coming in, people uh, with uh, a variety of reasons it might make it difficult for them to show up and stand for the amount of time I stood in the hallway tonight. Um, I'm a fairly healthy 39 year old and my feet hurt a lot, right? Um, that uh, it, it's frequently the people who are most vulnerable in our city, who are the hardest to see. And so who would be easiest to overlook by accident, by council or by city employees. And they're the voices you need to hear the most. So having more access to council, making it easier for people to talk to you about their concerns, about their needs is vital. Don't limit the numbers. Don't limit the modes of access to you. That keeps you from being able to solve the problems we have and make Stanton a better place to live for all of its people. And if you don't want to make Stanton a better place to live for everyone who lives here, then please ask yourself why you ran for the seat in the first place. Thank you. Next speaker. Welcome. Madam Mayor, uh, honorable council members. <clears throat> uh, my name is Leslie Kipp. I, um, I live at 16 Church Street. And I'm here to speak, I think, about the general topic of conversation that everybody's talking about. But there's a couple of things that um, concern me here. The first thing is, and let me just refer to a conversation I had, uh, oh, it was about two or three weeks ago with a tenured professor at the um, University of Virginia who lives here in Stanton. And I asked him, I said, look, how has all this remote learning, what's your, what's your impact or your uh, uh, impression of that now that you've been at it for a year? And I said, do you want to get back to face-to-face -to -face, uh, lectures and stuff? He said, I am very, very frustrated with the remote learning. He said, I cannot see the, uh, the body language. I cannot see the reaction of the people that I'm talking to. He said, it's, it's, it's very, very disconcerting to me. He says, I just don't know he says, if I'm getting through to people. He says, you know, when you look out over a classroom that some of them are texting, some of them are not paying attention, others are really engaged. And so I would like to take that lesson that he imparted to me and let's apply it to the council here. I am in favor of things that as much person to person engagement as you can have face to face, that is what gives life it gives uh, dynamism to a democracy. Quite frankly, when I hear a remote voice coming in from, I don't know where it came in from, um, I'm less engaged, but more importantly, I want to see that person. I want to see their body language. I want to see what they're, uh, get some, some visual clues from them. I think a healthy democracy requires as much face-to-face um, -face engagement is possible. Uh, I would, uh, the five minute rule as a practical thing, that's, that's probably not a bad thing, um, but I would look very closely at limiting the number of speakers that you have. I've been to, uh, a year ago, I went to an Augusta County meeting where they sat up till one o'clock in the morning and they listened to every speaker. Uh, sometimes uh, you have to do what Abraham Lincoln used to refer to is just take a public relations bath. And so I'm against, uh, or I, I have no problems and I don't regard it as a first amendment issue if you limit the remote access. Um, and what I would do is I would hope that you would uh, to encourage face-to-face -face, um, comments, because that is really what gives democracy life. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker. Welcome. Hi, 
Madam Mayor and City Council, my name is Darlene Schneck and I live at 1410 North Coulter Street here in Stanton. The proposal to limit the number of people who can comment during matters of the public to 10 people would be, in my view, a blow to democracy here in Stanton. It would instead become the matters of the few because the right to comment for the other significant portion of Stanton citizens who live and work and vote here would be basically choked off. Um, yes, there are other ways to address council, but speaking live during actual government meetings, directly addressing our elected officials and looking you all in the eye. I mean, it's great to be here today, actually. Um, it's the height of petitioning all of you who have been chosen to serve. Uh, the right to petition our government without punishment and reprisal is one of the most fundamental freedoms we have as American citizens. Declared by the Supreme Court to be an inalienable right, it grants us not only the freedom to speak out against injustices we might feel are happening, but it grants us the power to help change those injustices. So if you start limiting the voices of citizens during city council meetings, we as a city will miss opportunities to affect positive change. So I'm okay with time limits. However, in terms of numbers, I urge the council to keep the doors of public participation wide open. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Next speaker. Hello. My name is Brady Johnson and I've lived in the city of Stanton since August 2017. I am a lover of our small yet progressive town. I st stress progressive as it has been a breath of fresh air to live in a small town in the south and still be proud of forward thinking policies in our community. And that is why I stand before you. You as our leadership stand at a crossroads to listen to the inspirational teachings of your constituency and progress as a community or continue to be stagnant as the world moves forward around you and therefore regressive. As a Stantonian, as a mother and as a believer in democracy, I implore you to keep your minds and ears open to the wise words of your constituents. To hear one citizen's personal plight, I have two jobs, volunteer several hours a week and I'm a single mother. We all do not have the same 24 hours in a day. It is great privilege and luxury to be able to attend these meetings. Please do not silence us. If you do not wanna hear us, resign. There are a good many individuals who would relish the opportunity to sit in your seats of privilege. But alas, we do not have the funds of a Republican political action committee backing us that donated to several of your campaigns. <laughs> To quote Abraham Lincoln, this country with its institutions belongs to the people who inhabit it. Whether they shall grow weary of the existing government, they can exercise their constitutional right of amending it or exercise their revolutionary right to overthrow it. I give immense thanks and gratitude to certain council members for your continued efforts to ensure a transparent, inclusive local government. And also I repeat my previous request and encourage you to hire a sign language interpreter. My final quote, you can read on my back as I depart. They are your own words, Madam Mayor. I pray you do not forget them. Thank you. Next speaker. Hi, this is Yvonne Wilson, 2017 First Street. You know, there was a lot to swallow today, listening about people talking about marginalized voices. When I am proud to say I am the most marginalized voice in this building. I am a black conservative, former Marine Trump supporter. My voice gets silenced on every platform, you name it, Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, YouTube. I find it interesting that the very people that are talking about, please don't silence marginalized voices, have no problem marginalizing voices like mine, because I've seen your Facebook posts, I've seen your comments, I've seen your interactions with the current city council, and the hypocrisy actually kind of sickens me. 
Every last one of you that want to carry a badge of honor speaking for black voices and women's voices and marginalized voices. I'm the token Negro you talk about in the back rooms. You don't acknowledge my presence at all. There have been many times that I have been in this chamber speaking my mind. News leader has sat right there taking my picture. Have you seen my face in that news, in news leader? Have you? Let me know, because I haven't seen it. I've been here several times. Now, I do understand that nobody wants to have limits on speaking in city council. But can we really blame, considering that I have been a witness to the ongoing slugfest that has been going on ever since that has been brought to the agenda? You guys have no problems slamming other people on other platforms, insulting them, belittling them, and yet you still think you should have the right to do the same to others. There's a difference between First Amendment and abuse. I'm pretty sure everybody in here understands what verbal abuse is, what psychological abuse is. And we have had increases of that since we've been on lockdown. We haven't gotten any better. But then you come out and you dish that same abuse here. You have the nerve to ask city council, what message are you sending? Not even thinking about what messages you are sending. So far, everyone who has spoken up here has spoken against my voice. You've insulted Republicans. I have been a Republican all my life. I have people who are not alive anymore serving this country, who are proud Republicans, who died for you to act like a fool and insult city council. So don't come here and talk about how marginalized you are because a dead veteran is more marginalized than you. They can't speak no more. Now, I'm not saying this to belittle what you stand for. I do not agree with everything that you all say tonight, but I do agree with your right to say it. But it's how you say it. How do you expect me to come to your side as a Republican to a liberal when you're sitting here insulting everybody else that doesn't agree with you? You think I want to be friends with you after that? Really? Some of y'all have spoken to me out there. I said, hey, how you doing? I am very easy to talk to. But I will tell you what I think of you. And I think that a lot of you are trying to reclaim the glory of protest in the 60s. We're not in the 60s anymore, ladies and gentlemen. There's not one Jim Crow law that is on the books right now that is restricting my right to speak. And there is nothing that any of you can speak for that you can give me that I can't get myself. So stop acting like you're such advocates for marginalized voices and actually tolerate those that don't agree with you and do it with respect because right now it ain't looking so good Your from understanding thank you next speaker welcome hello joanne tiger north augusta street uh, come visit my little free library. Leave a book, take a book. That's just a non-paid uh, advertisement there. Um, I left three of the loves of my life to be here this evening. My 10-year-old granddaughter, Lila June, and the cutest two-year-old in the world, Gray, my grandson, and a pretty awesome husband named Tom. Uh, we've been married to each other twice. We took a break in there for a while and got remarried. So, you know, he's pretty awesome, okay? Anyway, you know why I'm up here to speak. It's not the first time. And uh, hopefully it'll be the last. You know, hopefully things will go the way we want them to. 
some of us want him to. What you don't know is how hard it is for me to be here at times. I live in almost constant pain due to having medical issues. Don't look like it. I saw that look, Mayor Oaks. And I, I'm not, no, I'm not criticizing you. It's just uh, most people don't know that. And I'm not asking for your sympathy. I'm just giving you some information because there are many people who do have disabilities that you wouldn't know it. Um, I uh, suffered uh, an accident in late 2004, not a car accident, an accident that I had myself. I sat my, what then was a very ample rear end in the wrong place. And I went down some steps backwards and fractured a vertebra. Went to Augusta Health, they did an x-ray and said, here's some Vicodin, you'll be okay by Monday. And uh, fortunately, I don't even, it's all a blur. Fortunately, Dr. Linker sent me for an MRI at a later date. He said, something's not right. And I said, you're telling me, you know, um, it's truly all a blur. Um, found out that a vertebra was in fact fractured after two very serious surgeries, leaving me with permanent nerve damage in my spine uh, and the pain. I'm on two very strong pain medicines, probably for the rest of my days. Uh, and I'm thankful that they exist, or I probably would have found a tall bridge with nothing soft at the bottom. And that's not a joke. Uh, the pain is nothing to laugh about. My joys besides my family and playing in the dirt in my yard, although I need said for I mentioned Tom's help, if it involves anything beyond a small hand tool, uh, or playing in said dirt. And I've got some nice gardens. If you ever want to take a, take a tour, come by. I'll be glad to show you. Uh, and reading. My point being, after I begin my meds around lunchtime in the day, I don't drive. There's no law that says I can't. I'm sure there's still some meds residue in my system from the day before, but I choose not to drive unless it were a true emergency because it just makes sense. Now, I don't feel any of the seven dwarfs, dopey, sleepy, doc, any of them when I take my meds. They just help me to function, although I'm a little, maybe sound a little weird when I'm talking to you all because I'm a little nervous. Um, but I think that's the responsible choice not to drive when you're on strong medicine. So to be here, I either need to arrange an, a ride with someone, and usually that's pretty simple, um, or I walk. And let me tell you, that's kind of part of the point of my talk is I'm thankful. I thank God every day that I can walk because when they finally did the MRI, they said, you could sneeze right now and be paralyzed. You could step off a curb and your foot be turned and be paralyzed. Um, not that, as again, I don't want your sympathy. I'm just trying to tell you that you can't tell by looking at someone what they, what they deal with. Uh, if I didn't, weren't able to walk or uh, have friends that would give me a ride to this meeting, I wouldn't be able to be here. And sometimes that won't happen. And Zoom will be important to me or calling in will be important to me. The workings of the city are important to me. I moved here in 1988. Stanton is my home. And the city is hmm, one of the close to the loves of my life. Not my grandchildren, not my husband, but I love Stanton. And I need to be a part of it. Your time is up. Thank, Thank you. you. Next speaker. Hello. Hi, um, welcome. Sean Stolzatz, Spotswood Road. So in the 2020 presidential election, there were roughly 13,000 votes cast inside the city of Stanton. Um, 2018 midterms, that number was about 9,500. 2016 presidential election, roughly 11,000. In the 2020 May local elections, 4,723 votes were cast. That's pathetic. That's a voter turnout rate of 30% among registered voters. If we took it among eligible voters, it would be even lower. 
Um, and to be clear, 2020 May was an outlier in that so many people turned up. Usually the number is far fewer for um, Stanton local races. Um, that says a few things. Number one, it says we desperately need to move those races from where they are now in May to November. But number two, it speaks to how little attention local politics um, normally draws, which is why it is so great to see all of these people who have turned up to make their voices heard to the city council. And a lot of these people seem to be um, kind of putting forward the idea that the city council, and in particular four members of that council, are setting out to silence folks. You can understand where they got that idea from. As I understand it, Vice Mayor Robertson, with the assent of several other members of the council, has proposed to reduce the number of people allowed to speak during matters from the public from unlimited to 10. That sounds like an awful idea. Number one, because it threatens to mute like out vast outpourings of public opinion, like we saw on 2A Sanctuary, like we're seeing today, like we will doubtless see again. But number two, because people might not bother coming up with something to say, might not bother showing up if they can't be certain their voice will be heard. So one might reasonably ask, why is the council doing this? And it certainly does look from the outside looking in as though this is about thin-skinned councillors who cannot stand to hear critiques from the plebs. Let's not assume that though. Let's very charitably assume that these changes are a simple time-saving measure. Whose time? Not the public's time. If, if the matters from the public drags on 18 or 20 speakers, members of the public can just leave. Granted, they won't get to speak their piece if they leave, but under these reforms, they won't get to speak their piece anyway. No, if this is a time-saving measure, it is about saving the council's time. It is about councillors who believe that they have better things to do on a Thursday evening than listen to the concerns of the whole public. If that's the motivating logic, and in particular, if that's the motivating logic for our four most recently elected councillors, I would like to remind you of something very important, a detail which seems you may have forgotten. You wanted this job. You wanted this job badly. You campaigned for this job. To your credit, you campaigned for this job hard. You campaigned for this job quite effectively. You campaigned for this job knowing full well what matters from the public sections tend to look like in Stanton. Um, nevertheless, you wanted this job. You wanted it so badly that you raised $26,000 um, to acquire this job, 10,000 of it through a pack. That is an amount that dwarfs the typical amount spent on a Stanton local race, just for a morsel of context there. Um, the Blue Ridge Area Food Bank estimates that for a dollar they can provide about four meals. They, they purchase in bulk, they do all kinds of other things. You wanted this job so badly that you spent a sum of money to get this job um, that could have fed 100,000 meals to Stantonians in need. Um, you wanted this job so badly. Um, Census Bureau estimates median income household in Stanton is roughly 52,000 a year, um, that you spent half of what the median Stanton household makes in a year um, to acquire this job. So if you find that the job has become rather tedious, if you have grown tired of listening to the concerns of the whole public and feel that on Thursday nights you have something better to do, I strongly suggest either that you rediscover the remarkable civic zeal which led you to so aggressively pursue these positions to begin with, or that you resign. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Hello. Hello. Deborah Kushner, North Augusta Street. What's behind the sudden push to limit citizen comments? City councilors represent their constituents. With strict limits on public comments, council can't learn how we think and feel. I recently spoke with a senator's aide, a former senator, a former city councilor. Acknowledging that evening meeting times excluded many people, her council held alternate afternoon meetings. Innovative, kind, and inclusive. We can't know that you receive our emails because you usually don't respond. Matters from the public has for a long time been just to listen. The call-in option during the pandemic has given Stanton more access to city council for all voices to be heard. This should be celebrated as a rare pandemic plus. From the city's February 4th, 2021 press release on the $200,000 $200, CARES Act funds for, quote, significant technology improvements 
to the overall functioning of city council meetings that will improve public access and engagement, end quote. Public access and engagement will not improve with these new restrictions in place, although the technology is here and ready. Also in this press release, an investment, quote, in a robust and permanent modernization program to significantly upgrade the city's video slash live meeting arrangements for the long term, end quote. I assume there are plans to return the CARES Act funds since they aren't being used for the intended purpose. Something must have happened to make the formerly permanent modernization for public access and engagement temporary. But is your interest in limiting citizen comments a city council-wide agreement with Council Cla Councilor Claffey's Facebook post about his perception that meetings last too long, but you want to tack on 15 minutes of councilor rebuttal time? One of you said after the last election, quote, I would really like to have a platform in which citizens are heard. Yes, Mayor, we would too. The oath of office, which you all swore to, states that you, quote, will faithfully and impartially discharge all the duties incumbent upon me. If you cannot faithfully and impartially represent all your constituents, you should consider other career options. Democracy is firmly based on a belief in the fundamental importance of the individual. Each individual, no matter what his or her station in life, is a separate and distinct being. Every person in a democracy matters for a government to be, quote, of the people, by the people, and for the people, end quote. But in these chambers, the most important people part is missing. Each time a constituent is called out, shut down, or has a finger wagged in their direction, a piece of the democratic system withers. Dissent is healthy. These new restrictions are meant to not only squash dissent, but all voices. It's censorship. In statistics and in science, the larger the size of a study or survey, the more accurate the results. So without hearing from the people, you are making decisions in a void. Is this the point of suppression, suppress, suppressing the public's voice? Rule without regard for consequences or input from the people is not a democracy. Typically fewer than 10 people comment at a council session, but the number of unpopular decisions made by this counselor have people turning up in larger numbers. You're choosing to shut down voices of dissent and this isn't how a democracy functions. So you must decide if you're willing and able to listen and represent our interests. Freedom of speech is as critical as freedom of the press. Both are currently under attack. Your job is to prove you believe in the US and Virginia constitution, constitutions that you've sworn to uphold. Given that it's your sworn oath to represent us, then listen to us. I can only surmise the reason for the new restrictions you propose is that you just don't care. It's just beyond tragic for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Hello. Robert, Robert Clummer, 302 Audubon Street. Um, members of City Council, this August Chamber, thank you for having us this evening and letting us address you. Uh, I believe that this resolution, unfortunately, would be an affront to our First Amendment right and our ability to petition our government and have our redress, redress our grievances. Mayor Oaks, earlier this year, you quoted Martin Luther King and mentioned that riots, uh, riots are the language of the unheard, and you encourage citizens to take the time to listen to others with honor and integrity. Guys, Mayor Robertson, in a WHSV piece the other night, you were mentioning, quoted, that you were just hoping that this resolution, you're just hoping to try to give more people the chance to speak. And I think this evening with everybody here, this is the idea of people are speaking, people are being heard. Everybody campaigned on listening to the voices of Stantonians. So I appreciate all of you. I appreciate you doing all of that. I'm just worried that, that these time limits, not necessarily time limits, but even just a, a 10 person speaking limit, that would end up monopolizing time for certain folks. A speaker earlier this evening, he mentioned how the majority of a lot of folks coming to city hall, city council to speak, have come here on multiple occasions and the idea that they're being heard over and over. And I feel like 
if there's a time limit, if I wanted to come in and talk about potholes on West Beverly Street, if I was number six to walk into the building, I'd have to be told to come back to the next meeting and that you would be heard. If I wanted to come and I wanted to talk about our meals tax being one of the most regressive meal taxes in the state, if I was caller number eight, I'd have to wait another week to be heard. If there was a big contentious issue like this, I, you know, I'm working and everything like that, and I don't necessarily have times, and I appreciate you folks all listening, but you know, this is the time I got. But if I'm, you know, number 22, number 23 to come in, I might not ever be heard, even if this issue, you know, this issue be voted on, I might never be heard. I know there are folks, you know, talking about we can email and call or our council members. Um, last fall, I had an issue with parking enforcement. I mentioned something about that. And I emailed folks on city council and councilwoman Mead, she reached out to me in a, in a phone call and urged me to make sure, encourage civility and not try to keep it civil. And then Mayor Oaks mentioned, I got an email from Mayor Oaks and she mentioned that she would check with Mayor Rosenberg, but I never unfortunately got a, got a follow up and I don't know if that was lost in the just lost in everything that it is having to do what you all do. But I just feel that having this avenue of being able to address our council and address our, our I don't know, we need to encourage more civic participation, not less of it. Um, another thing, I guess with mem uh, you know, matters of the public, and then at the end, the idea of a rebuttal. I remember when I was in the Scouts, when I was 16, we went, uh, we were urged to go to the Augusta County Board of Supervisors meeting to speak at, uh, about rezoning piece of camp property. And there's also a merit badge requirement that you're supposed to, you know, participate civically. And I remember talking for five minutes and I can talk about Tracy Piles because he's retired and there's no opportunity of him to find me $1,200, but he stuck his finger after I spoke to a 16 year old me and stuck his finger out and pointed at me and, you know, I don't think that that was necessarily a good role model or a good example of what white local government should be. So I encourage you to listen to, to the folks coming in here this evening and to increase participation and avenues for it um, and let the people of Stanton be heard. Thank you all for your time. Thank you. Next speaker. My name is Cindy Connors. I live at 106A Skyline Avenue. Um, I want to echo the sentiments of all the other folks that have spoken before me. Um, I speak against all the amendments to restrict the matters from the public. Um, as one of the frequent flyers mentioned by one of the speakers earlier, uh, I want you to know sometimes there's a reason for that. I'm not shy. I'm not afraid to speak at the microphone. Many, many, many people I know are. Many people don't have time to come. Maybe many people don't feel confident enough. They don't feel educated enough. My neighbors, and I have a very tight knit group of neighbors on the West End, are grateful for the fact that I come to the city council meetings and that I speak for them. And I'm going to continue to do that. My intention is not to monopolize anyone's time or keep anyone else from speaking. In fact, I'm speaking passionately to preserve anyone's right to speak at this microphone, regardless if they agree or disagree with me and you all. So um, I guess I'll leave it with that. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Next speaker. So I'm just going to put this up here because when I spoke a couple of meetings ago, I let everyone know that this is dear to my heart. Local democracy, citizen and Can you state your name and address, please? Yes. My name is Dr. Ann Hunter. That title is relevant tonight. I don't typically use it in this forum, but it's relevant tonight. I am a psychologist and that title relates to two things I wanna say, two points I wanna make. One is that I'm concerned about some unprofessional behavior among city council members. I'm not gonna say names. I get no pleasure in that. 
but but I think it is inappropriate. It suggests some, I'll say it, psychological issues when there is a lack of self-control among a city by, from a city leader. You know who you are. I think it's really important that you get some help with that. It is not a good look. Also, there's been accusations and assumptions, some accusations, some assumptions from certain city council members about the silent Stanton campaign. And I even heard on my drive home from Lynchburg today, when I was listening in on the work session, the word lies thrown out as an accusation from some of the uh, constituents. That's not appropriate. And I could in return say a statement that I also heard about the number of other localities that are restricting the um, time limit to three minutes is what most localities are doing. And I'm in the car thinking, that's not true. Is that a lie? I wouldn't, I wouldn't say to that city council member, you're lying. That is just not professional behavior. That word should not be used in this chamber. Secondly, a couple of people tonight have spoken with another assumption that those of us who are here and have been for several weeks because we're concerned about the dismantling of local democracy. And those two people made some assumptions about our political leanings. We have stated over and over again that this is not a political issue. It's not a partisan issue. It's a democracy issue. That's what we're about. And we're about the right of every citizen to speak their mind, regardless of whether I or anyone else agrees with them or not. There have been people, I've been coming to city council meetings for years. There have been people who have said all kinds of things that made me kind of cringe, but it's their right to say it. It's all of our right to say what's on our mind. You were hired to listen to us. And if it takes three hours, to hear from us, so be it. It's your job to listen to us and not to have the opportunity to defend yourself to us. That's not part of your job description. If you want to do that, I suggest we have some town meetings. As a psychologist, I think town meetings are very important because it gives people an opportunity to dialogue, the council members and the public. That is a very healthy environment. I'm a social psychologist. I'm all about how social environments impact the thinking, behavior, and emotions of people. Let's create those healthy forums, those town meetings where we can actually dialogue. I'm interested in what you, how you think, you think, you think, you think, you think, you, you think, all of you. And I want you to be just as interested in how I think. Let's create that healthy opportunity for dialogue. Not set up. Your time this, is up. Not Thank set you. up this. I will Your have time the last up. word. Your time is up. I hear please you. step away from the podium. I will. And you should allow people. Officer, to will you please escort sentence. her away from the podium? Next speaker. Good evening, Council. My name is James Mills. I live on 1500 North Colca Street in apartment C9. Um, I believe I'm the last speaker. Uh, so thank you for listening to everyone tonight. Uh, I am opposed to the memorandum for changes uh, proposed by Vice Mayor Robertson, particularly the limiting of speakers to 10. Um, the three minute 
uh, limitation that Charlottesville has, and I don't know this for sure, but they're a larger city than we are. I would assume they have more engagement. Um, I could be wrong. But if we get to that point where, you know, every time we're here, we've got 30 people speaking, 40, 50 people who want to speak, then, you know, maybe at that time, make a special announcement that three minutes or two minutes, however you feel would be fair during that particular meeting. And if there's an issue that you feel is dominating, uh, you know, matters of the public, then uh, I second what Dr. Hunter said, consider having a special meeting, a town hall, um, a forum of some kind to invite citizens to come on that issue um, and to hear from both sides. I, you know, we, we had um, a couple of people um, who were speaking out against the, the movement here tonight, the, the Silent Stanton um, and um, their opposition to the, the, the changes. That's great. It's wonderful. <laughs> you know, that's, um, that's, uh, that's engagement. That's local government engagement. And I think we need more of it. Um, and I think restricting um, is going gonna, is gonna to hamper that. This is an issue that I think previous councils should have addressed. Um, they should have opened these up more, um, made them more accessible, um, because it all starts locally. You know, it's your neighbor, it's your city. You know, the discussion tonight about the flooding, you know, that affects everybody. And, you know, how many citizens actually know what might be done about it? Um, so I would encourage if you're going to make you know, memorandum changes, try to think about ways to engage more with the community um, and not about ways to, to restrict things. Um, don't believe I have anything else. So thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Next speaker. Welcome. Alison Profeta, I live on Farrier Court in Stanton. At the May 13th council meeting, Vice Mayor Robertson turned to council member Holmes and said, Terry, I'm trying to meet you halfway. I was watching from home and allowed myself to feel hopeful that an actual compromise would be reached, particularly when a compromise was offered. Allow constituents to utilize the telephone bridge and participate remotely in a temporary way until council had the time that Mayor Oaks and Vice Mayor Robertson requested to further discuss the issue of remote participation some more, but that compromise was voted down. Instead, Vice Mayor Robertson has proposed restrictions to public comments and matters from the public. Despite having once written on his own official Facebook page, I will listen to all voices and opinions, regardless of whether we agree or disagree on issues, and I will do so with an open mind. That emphasis on the word all is his, he put it in all caps. I still want to believe a compromise on one of his suggestions is possible. Instead of cutting the time limit to three minutes across the board, is there a way council could be empowered to reduce speaking time just on evenings when a meeting has the potential to run long? However, the notion of limiting the number of speakers is particularly punishing, especially after hearing Vice Mayor Robertson on WHSV yesterday say, quote, basically it's the same people over and over. And if somebody wants to speak on a subject that has not had a chance to speak, we wanna give them priority. It is not the job of any council member to decide who should and shouldn't speak. There have been times that the only speaker here in chambers was Mr. Jennings. It disturbed me to hear the vice mayor complaining about repeat speakers. I'm shocked any council member would publicly complain about any speakers. I may not always agree with the views of a speaker, but if anybody wants to speak at every meeting, I fully support their right to do so without facing retribution from council and then being told that they can't speak at the next meeting. There are no current restrictions. So if council's hearing from the same people over and over and not from others, the only thing stopping others from speaking are their own choices and or their ability to attend and speak. I will also remind all of you that if you at any time administer any of these suggestions differently to different people, you create the potential for the city to face lawsuits from those who've been discriminated against. If someone speaks at the first meeting of a month and can't be prioritized to speak at the second meeting of the month, you will have to tell them no, even if they support you and have always showed up to speak at meetings. 
What if someone on staff slips up and prohibits someone from speaking at the second meeting because they thought the person spoke at the first meeting? What will be done if someone speaks at the second meeting, but not the first, and then wants to speak at the first meeting the following month? You'll create a logistical and potentially legal nightmare for city staff. Today, Council Member Robertson threw out the idea of naming a specific end time for council meetings. I believe he said 9 or 9.15. If city business lasts until that time, will there be no matters from the public? The idea of a rebuttal period at the end of matters is not just confusing, but combative. Do you not have the floor for hours during each meeting? Do you not already have a specific matters from council period? Council Member Dull tonight utilized her time to address exactly what Vice Mayor Robertson's concerns are, having the time to address anything that a council member considers lies. If a council member feels lies are being spread about them, the floor is yours during that time. Not to mention that you can also share your thoughts on official social media accounts, in emails and or phone calls, during town halls or other public events that you can host. I urge city council to not limit the number of speakers at meetings, to not implement ways for council or staff to cherry pick who does and doesn't get to speak, to not introduce rebuttal periods that are redundant based on all the current means that council members have to communicate with constituents, and to do your best not to reduce speaking times of constituents unless doing so on a particularly busy evening would help shorten the length of a potentially lengthy meeting. I urge all of you to remember that this is a time for you as a council simply to listen to citizens and to always encourage engagement with local government, not restrict it. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional speakers? Welcome. Welcome. My, my name is Baldwin Jennings, 332 Sharon Lane, Stanton, Virginia. First, I want everybody to know I was born and raised in this town. This is one of the most outstanding towns in the world. I drove trotted for 20 years in the United States Air Force, put five years of it in non combat area. I took and uh, been in places where if you own a chicken, you slept with it. You don't know how lucky we are to have this town and this, and this council up here take care of us. Uh, our former mayor, uh, you know, I, I, I understand you being sick and uh, need to need to stay at home, but you know you're not that uh, not that bad looking lady. And I look at the screen up there and it's blank. I see your name down in the bottom of it. If you if you gonna stay home, that's fine. But you all be on the screen so we can see you. And me is as council me that I got a lot of respect for you. But on this regional jail thing coming up, I advise you to. Uh, just staying clear but you got too much interest in it and uh so just staying clear of it and um, as far as this council goes the city goes we got an outstanding city here we you know the trash gets picked up the streets stay clean uh we have a good government uh, we got an outstanding council i've been going to these council meetings for over 40 years ever since i've been back home and right now we got about as strong a council as we ever had and then for the interest of the people, and I and still getting down here crying and bitching about them, support them and get things done. That's how you get things done. You get up here and you give your ideas and you follow them up. And uh, if you, and all you got to do is just get out and put a little bit of effort. And uh, anyway, uh, y'all council members, all, all seven of you, you're doing an outstanding job. So just hang in there and put up with the crime and, and we will survive and be a stronger town. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, any additional speakers? All right, hearing none, as mayor of the city of Stanton, did you want to speak? Oh, go right ahead. I want to compliment you first of all listening to all of these people with all of their problems. It takes us quite a deal, quite a bit of tenacity to be able to do that. And I want to also let you know that I'm a tight-fisted Democrat. And this past year, I voted for all of you because a change was needed. You know, it used to be government of the people by the people and for the people. It's changed considerably. It has to go back that way. 
people have to understand that those people who are in positions of authority have to help and have to be considerate and courteous. Too many, once they get into positions of authority, lose all of their sense of responsibility. I only, I'm here only because I have a problem with the assessor's office. I had an appointment and I had to give, I gave them about seven days notice that I would not be able to handle that appointment. All I wanted was another date. And I doubt whether he was going to give me that date. Not only that, I asked for a short history of the people who were going to make the assessments at that meeting. All I got was a series of names and they were all associated with real estate. There wasn't one person there that didn't have something to do with real estate. Something is terribly wrong here. It's out of order. You go in there and you got three or four people who are in the real estate business and you know bloody well that they're in the business of making money. They want the assessments up and there's not much you can do about it. This happened to me last year. My assessment last year, or not last year, in 2016 went up by over 160%. This year, it's also up by 15 or so percent. So in the past four years, it's been up quite a bit. And there, I asked for information and the, he couldn't give me much information. He gave me a couple of slips that had no relevancy whatsoever to my particular facility. It was a burnt out facility. It was sold to me by a member of the appeals board. And he charged me too much. And I needed the place because I was selling the process of selling a bed and breakfast, an antique shop and a restaurant out in West Augusta. So, and not only that, after doing some research, I find that that individual has been, dis he was an attorney here in Stanton at one time, and he was disbarred back in 1985. They say, no, he wasn't disbarred. He was suspended back in 1985, somewhere around there. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. But, and not only that, I find that there was another comment that was made relating to him. And he was representing somebody who had tons of money here in the area. And one of his comments was, I don't care as an attorney, I don't care whether I win or lose, but I'm going to take his money. Now, that's not a very good person to be having sitting on a board of assessments. And that's about all. All I want is another appointment, and I would like some of those people off. I was told by the director of the assessment uh, place there, downstairs, that, hey, they could have as many uh, real estate people on the assessment as they want. Well, that shouldn't be. That shouldn't be. You people are now in a position to bring government to the people, proper government, fair government. And I know that I suspect just listening to all of these concerns and looking at you and trying to analyze character, and I'm very good at that. Your time is up. I'm okay. Just, can you uh, give us your name and address, please? My name is Albino, A-L-B-I-N-O, Fossa. F-O-S-S-A, and I live at 401 Bowling Street. All right. Um, Mr. Rosenberg, can you um, speak with um, and this I gentleman? And I thank you for listening. Thank, thank you. you. Can and you, you know, speak with this gentleman and get his information so he can potentially have another appointment set up? So thank and you. And they say silence is golden, but it isn't. 
All right. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any additional speakers? And best of luck to all of you. Thank you. All right. As the mayor of the city of Stanton, I call the May 27th, 2021 meeting adjourned.